you announce, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yesterday we spoke about the December 30th, which would have been the 10th anniversary of their marriage. Uh, again, did you recall or do you recall having any contact with Andrea on that day? No, I do not remember having any contact with her okay. at that time. Uh, but you did Skype, you did have access to Skyping at that time, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, over the following period of time, would you have Skype, well, during December of 2010, do you recall Skyping at all with Andrea? No, I don't remember. Okay. Um, do you recall Skyping with either Andrea or the grandkids during the year 2011? I may have, I don't recall. Okay, and uh, at some point, do you recall getting a, um, finding out that Sophia had some sort of eye device that enabled you to Skype directly with her? She had some device on her iPod, and uh, we never set it up, so I don't, we never did that. Okay. Now, yesterday, there you were asked some questions on direct examination about civil litigation. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Okay. And there is currently a civil litigation going on involving the state of Georgia and Mrs. Snyderman, correct? Yes. And you have sought to intervene in that civil litigation, have yes. you not? That civil, civil litigation is currently pending in the Superior Court of Fulton County as opposed to DeKalb County, is that correct? Yes. Okay. You are the contingent beneficiary on one of the life insurance policies. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, for those of us who are not familiar with insurance, first off, can you explain what a beneficiary is? That's the person who would get the proceeds of the life insurance on the death of okay. And what is the contingent beneficiary? That's the person who would get the money in the event that, in this case, if Andrea had died before Rusty or in a simultaneous death. So if, for whatever reason, Andrea could not get, uh, could not be the beneficiary, then the contingent beneficiary would get the proceeds of the insurance policy, correct? That's correct. And in, as your status as a contingent beneficiary, you are seeking to get the proceeds of at least one of the life insurance policies, correct? No, that's really not correct. No. I'm, explain, okay, go ahead, sir. Feel free to explain. Yes, go ahead. Okay. When Rusty set up the policy, his children weren't born, so he needed a contingent beneficiary in the event of a simultaneous death. So he named me. Now that the children are there, that money belongs to my grandkids. It would be put into a trust for them. I have no intention of taking the money. I only intervened because the civil lawyer who represents Andrea drafted a trust agreement, which I didn't like and I wanted to vote in the language of the trust. Okay. When you say the civil lawyer who represents Andrea, that is not any of those folks who are... Some of them. Okay. Some of you are represent okay. her. I, I am not. Is that you are not. Statement? Okay. No, you are not. Mr. Morgan and Mr. Petrie are not. Is that correct? Sir? That's correct. Okay. And uh, there was a trust agreement. When you say drafted a trust agreement, would that have been a trust agreement for the benefit of the kids? Yes. And would the kids in question be in and Sophia. Yes. And they are, so there's no mistake, the kids of both Andrea and Rusty, correct? That's correct. Okay. And there was apparently an inability or a lack of resolution as to that particular trust, correct? That's correct. And that is why you have sought to intervene, is that yes, correct? Yes, I want to vote in the, I want to vote in the language of the trust. Okay. Now, um, going back to the morning of November the 18th of 2010, I just want to make sure I understand the time chronology correctly. You got a call from Andrea at 9.30 or shortly thereafter, is that correct, sir? That is correct. And that was a very brief phone conversation, correct? Yes. You then attempted to communicate with Rusty. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. At any time did you leave a message while attempting to communicate with Rusty, if you recall. I don't recall. At some point shortly thereafter, you called directory assistance to try to get the number for Dunwoody Prep, correct? Yes. You certainly did not have that number available at that time. No. And when you called Dunwoody Prep, you were told, uh, you related the conversation yesterday, 
but at some point you became aware of the fact somebody had done what he probably told you that Rossi had been shot, correct? That's correct. They confirmed it. And that would have been some 15 to 20 minutes after your original call with Andrea, is that correct? About that, yes. Now, and again, I realize we're dealing with approximations, but um, say the first phone call comes in around 9.35, 15 to 20 minutes after that phone call with Andrea, Andrea would be 9.50 to 9.55, correct? Something like that. Okay. Um, what exactly did the folks at Dunwoody Prep tell you? We asked what had happened, and the lady said Rusty had been shot, and we had some discussion about the extent of his wounds and his injuries and that kind of stuff, and they were telling us that he was, he was hurt badly, and somebody there gave us the number for um, the Atlanta Medical Center for, for us to call and track him down. Okay. Now, did anyone give you specifics as to how many times he had been shot? No. But you were, in fact, told by the folks at Dunwoody Prep that he had been hurt badly, correct? His pulse was weak, was what they had said. And you were also told that he had been transported to Atlanta Medical Center, correct? Yes. So you knew at that point that emergency medical intervention had been necessary, correct? Yes. And that would have been around 9.50 to 9.55 in the morning, correct, sir? Something like that. Steve was going from Cleveland to Chicago to Hawaii, correct? Yes. After you got off the phone at Dunwoody Prep, did you immediately call Steve and convey to him the extent of what you believed Rusty's injuries to be at that time? No, I sent him an email. Okay. And that was at 1038, correct? Yes. Now, 1038 is about 40 minutes or so at least. I, I can't tell you what time I called Dunwoody Prep. You don't recall the time I, you called I, Dunwoody I Prep? I don't know what time it was when I called Dunwoody Prep. So as soon as I could get my faculties together, I sent Stephen an email. Okay. Can you estimate, and if you cannot, that is fine, sir, but can you estimate for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the amount of time that passed from the time when you had the conversation with the folks at Dunwoody Prep until you communicated with Steve? I, I really can't tell you. It was not very long. Yesterday, you indicated that you did not tell Steve to stop his trip because you did not know anything about the extent of his injuries at that time. That's correct. As I say he, I mean Rusty, right? Correct. But you have testified this morning, if I am understanding correctly, that when you talked to the folks at Dunwoody Prep, they told you it was pretty bad, right? They told me his pulse was weak. Didn't tell me how bad it was. I didn't know. So I told Stephen to go on. How lengthy of a conversation did you have with the folks at Dunwoody Prep about Rusty's condition, if you recall, sir? Three, four minutes. Okay. Not very long. And again, you do not recall the name of the individual that you spoke to, right? Nope. And the individual who gave you both the name and number for Atlanta Medical Center was not the person to whom you were speaking. That's correct. But someone in the background. Someone in the background. Okay. Um, you talked about the life insurance, uh, and I, I guess I'm a little confused, and I apologize. Yesterday, when you were looking for, at the house, when you got to Dunwoody and you were at Andrea's house looking for life insurance documents, you said you found something. Was that the actual policy itself? No. I found the bills for the policy. Was there anything on the bill which shed light as to the amount of the policy? Yes. Did you subsequently have any communication yourself with a representative of Northwest Mutual Insurance Company? I don't think so. Okay. Does the name Burt Clark ring any bells for you? He was a person that Rusty worked with at Northwestern. Okay. Do you recall having any communication with Burt Clark yourself on or about, or during the period of time when you would have been in Dunwoody uh, after Rusty had been shot? I don't recall ever talking to Burt. Okay. Do you recall there being a safe at the uh, home of Rusty and Andrea while you were there? I know there's a safe in the house. I don't recall. I don't remember ever looking at it. Okay. Do you remember anyone attempting to open the safe and not being able to do so? No, I do not. Okay. Um, can you estimate for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the number of phone calls you had between yourself and Andrea in the month of November? after you folks went, left Cleveland and went back to, uh, or left Atlanta, I'm sorry, 
and went back to Cleveland. Half a dozen, dozen. Okay. And during the month of December, can you estimate the number of times you would have spoken to Andrea on the phone? Half a dozen, dozen. Okay. So it was reasonably frequently, not every day by any stretch of the no, imagination. We called a lot, but we didn't, we didn't get to her. Okay. Were you here, you testified in um, Mr. Newman's trial, correct sir? Yes sir. And uh, um, were you excused after your testimony and allowed to remain in the courtroom? Yes. Did any psychiatrist testify? I believe there were three psychiatrists who tested, maybe four. Okay. And were there psychi psychologists as well? Or yes. mental health experts? I yes. Guess? Can you, do you recall the, the total number of mental health experts who testified? Let's see, Dr. Breckhaus. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Five, six. Oh, I'm all over the objection. Go ahead. I'm giving okay. some latitude. You believe six testified? Five or six. I don't recall. The issue at Mr. Newman's trial was whether he was insane at the time he committed the offense, correct? I'm going to object to that, Your Honor. I'm going to sustain it on that objection. You want to ask a different question? Your Honor, may I be heard briefly? You may approach. Come on up, lawyers. I'm Jeff Hellinger along with defense attorney Will Smith. The attorney is now moving toward the bench and in front of Judge Adams. At issue here is Tom Clegg's use of the word insane when it came to Hemi Newman. Well, he was, he was asking um, whether or not insanity was at issue in the trial and Kelly Hill uh, objected uh, to relevance and Tom is, uh, is now approaching the judge uh, to try to make a proffer of why he thinks it's relevant. Hemi Newman has a, a large shadow in this trial. His name comes up in ways involving infidelity. It comes up in the, in the ways of uh, murder, all kinds of ways. It, it, it again has that feel that, that Hemi Newman murder trial part two. It, it really has had that sort of feel uh, over the last three days. Oh, 100%. I, I think regardless of, of what you think about the case, you, you recognize that it's almost like he's a co-defendant here, even though he's not. Um, but yeah, people, people knew about the trial and it bleeds over to this trial. You know, yesterday the uh, Melanie White, who was the Dunwoody uh, realtor, who was talking about her relationship with Emmy Newman and Emmy, you know, relaying allegations of his relationship with Andrea Snyderman of a very intimate nature. You know, the question whether he is credible or not, whether, you know, he has a sort of fictionalized account of all these things that transpired between April of 2010 and the murder um, in late November of 2010. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, I I I think the scandal and the the melodramatic nature is something that the prosecution's counting on here, uh, because a lot of these these counts deal with uh, did she lie about their relationship, and the melodrama is something that I think the prosecution started from day one. How long do you think Don Snyderman is going to be on the witness stand? Most of the morning? Uh, without a doubt, most of the morning. Um, I, I think that the defense, you know, like we were talking about earlier, needs to go slow and methodical um, with a lot of caution in, in questioning him as a witness because he is an extremely sympathetic witness. Something horrible and tragic happened to him. And so to undercut his credibility, it's, it's going to take some time. All right. The attorney is now uh, back to the table. You with those instructions. I sustain the objection to the last question that was put forth. Was there evidence presented at Mr. Newman's trial concerning his mental status as of November the 18th of 2010? Yes. Okay. Was there evidence presented as to his mental status by both the state and by the defense? Yes. Okay. Um, was there a dispute at the trial as to whether or not Hemi Newman was the person who shot and killed your son? No. Okay. One minute, please, Your Honor. You may. Take as much time as you need. Go back. Okay. Um, you 
you had, Andrea did in fact maintain some contact with you uh, um, in the months that followed um, January of 2011, right? Yes. Okay. Um, did you have occasion to attend, or did you visit her at any point? Um, I get, well, let me ask you this first. Did you and your wife come down to the Atlanta area uh, for court proceedings related to Mr. Newman? Yes. Okay. And would you have done so in, or did you plan to do so in October of 2011? Yes. Okay. Was the trial originally scheduled for trial? Yes. When I say the trial, Mr. Newman's trial. Yes. In October of 2011? Yes. Okay. Was it continued at the last minute? Yes. Did it actually take place in February of 2012? Yes. Did you come to Atlanta in October of 2011, even though the case was continued? No. Okay. Were you invited to Ian's birthday party in October of 2011? Yes. Did you attend that party, sir? No. Okay. Um, did Andrea, during the course of that time, provide you with pictures of the kids? Yes. Okay. How often would she have provided you with pictures of the kids, if you recall? I don't recall. Do you remember the te te method or technique that she would have used to provide you with pictures of the kids? She would have emailed them to. She would have emailed them to Costco, and I would go to Costco and pick them up. Okay. Um, do you remember actually viewing some of those pictures? Yes. And would they have been of birthday parties and similar type gatherings? Yes. Uh, were there a few pictures or a lot of pictures? There were a lot. Okay. When you say a lot, can you quantify that? And if you can't, that's perfectly fine, sir. There was a bunch. Okay. Um, had you, prior to Rusty's death, received pictures of family gatherings, birthday parties, things All of the that time. sort? Okay. And um, conference call regarding that particular yes. scholarship for Rusty. Okay. Did you attempt at some point to do so? Wasn't really interested in the scholarship program that she set up because at that time we already suspected that she had some involvement in the death of my son. So we had very little interest in doing anything. Whether I took part in the conference call or not, I don't remember. Okay. Um, well, let me show you what I, have, I will mark for purposes of identification, as I believe it will be Defense Exhibit Number 15. At this point, you do not have a 14, or you just I have 14? a 14 marked, Judge. I'll tell you what, what I will do. No, 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 that's fine. No, no. no that's fine. I We're will just keeping track of the numbers. What I will do right now is I've already shown it to Ms. Cross. You may. Sir, let me um, show you a document that has been marked for purposes of identification as defense exhibit number 14 and ask if you recognize that particular document. Yes. And what is defense exhibit number 14, sir? This is the motion. This is a motion to the Fulton County Court to it to have me intervene in the in the civil case that's pending. Okay. Is your son, Steve, is the estate also sought to intervene in that particular litigation, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, but the initial parties to that lawsuit were the state of Georgia and Andrea Snyder, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, let me show you what I have marked for purposes of identification as defendant's exhibit number 15. Younger, might I tender into evidence or seek to tender into evidence defense exhibit number 14 at this Any objection time. 14 at this time? I do have an objection, Your Honor, not to the pleading itself, but to the attachments containing irrelevant information to the, um, the relevancy of the document. 
I misunderstood, Your Honor. I will be glad to remove the attachments if Ms. Cross wishes. I was under the impression she wanted them, but that was my mistake. All right. Uh, I will allow in D14 without the attachments, and I will direct the lawyers to remove the attachments at this point in time. Out of abundance of caution before I forget that. So right All right. Fourteen is admitted without objection. You may publish it to the jury if you wish. Not at this time, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, may I approach you? Yes, sir. Mr. Schneiderman, let me show you a document that has been marked for purposes of identification as defendant's exhibit number 15. Do you recognize that document, sir? Okay. And do you recognize her, sir? I, I guess it. I guess it's a. I guess it's there, but I don't remember it. Okay. Uh, do you recall receiving an invitation from a guy named Greg Gerstenbacher, or I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his last name, and Andrea to participate in a conference call regarding the uh, scholarship fund? I'm not mentioned in the in that. I'm sorry? I'm not mentioned in that email. Okay. So I didn't get that. Look at the... Okay. You may have yeah, Did not publish it, please, sir. Hold it down for a minute. It's... Okay. My name's not here. Okay. So I didn't get this email. Okay. I got this email. Okay. Did you get an email from Andrea? Yes. You yes. You were, okay. I got an email from Andrea, but okay. not from this great... And was the document on the bottom attached, if you recall? I don't recall. Okay. Um, did you respond to Andrea's email? Yes, I tried to get in, and the, the code they gave me was invalid. I apparently had the wrong date. Okay. You, the, the code was correct. You had the wrong date, correct? Yeah, because there's no date in here. Okay. The conference call is yeah, March 17th. Yeah, but I don't know if I got that. You called on March 15th, right? Right. Okay. But the code is contained in the document after the date, right? Yes. And you had the right code, right? Yes. You simply got the wrong date, correct? Right. So you attempted to communicate yes. in this conference call, right? Yes. Now you have just testified here a few minutes ago that you were not interested I was in not being... Interested in, I was not interested. Okay. But you attempted to communicate and participate in the conference call, correct? I was going to listen in. Okay. Um, but you simply got the date wrong, right? Yep. Okay. Your Honor, I would uh, move to admit defense exhibit number 15 into evidence at this time. Any objection? for the entire document. Mr. Simon's portion of it, I think he's identified the, the remainder of the document, I think is relevant and object. Mr. Clare. You know, the relevant portions of the document, I have questioned Mr. Snyderman about uh, specifically whether it was forwarded to him by Mrs. Snyderman and whether he responded. That is why I'm seeking the admission of the document. Mr. Clare, may I ask, I, I have no problem letting that portion in, but I think there was a portion which he said he did not recognize that he may not have received. Can that be separated? I'm sure we can do that, Judge, uh, yes. I will allow in the portions in which he identified as far as the email from your client and yes, maybe sir. his response, but there was something else that he said he did not recognize that he may not have received. I would direct that that be, quote, unquote, removed before it's published to the jury. No problem. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You may uh, continue. Yes, sir. Um, you continued to help Andrea with her taxes after that date, correct, sir? Yes. Okay. Um, now, tax time, I guess most of us know, is in April. Yes. Uh, or thereabouts. Taxes are due usually on April the 15th or the first Monday thereafter. Yes. Okay. And you continued to do Andrea's taxes on her behalf, correct? On Rusty's behalf. Okay. How long did you continue to assist her with her taxes? Till that was the last filing I did for them. I'm sorry? That was the last filing I did. 2011 would have been the last time? 2010 was the last one. Done in 2011. Okay. So... 2010 would have been the last time you would have helped yes. her with her taxes? Yes. You did not assist her in 2011, is that correct? No. I helped her with her 2010 filing, which was due April 15, 2011. Okay, I'm sorry. 
So 2010 year taxes are due in yeah. April of 2011. We're a year behind, accountant, sir, you're behind I'm, everybody else. I'm not else. an accountant, sir, I apologize. Okay. Uh, let me ask you a question going back to November 19th of 2010. You had indicated that when the Dunwoody Police Department detectives uh, were at your house interviewing Andrea that you were present, correct? I was at Andrea's house, and Rusty's at house. Andrea's house, yes, I'm sorry. You were present, correct? Yes. And you actually sat in and listened to the interview as it was taking place, correct? Yes. Did you mention anything to either of the Dunwoody detectives, I believe it was a Sergeant Cordelino or an Investigator Thompson, about your conversation with Andrea of the day before? No. At that time, I didn't think it was relevant. Okay. Um, did you have occasion, you guys came down to, when I say you guys, I apologize, you and Mrs. Snyderman came down again to meet with Mr. Geary uh, in May of 2011, correct? Yes. Did you meet with Andrea and her kids at that time? Yes. Where did you meet at? Uh, Cold Stone. An ice cream parlor. Ice cream parlor? Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I remember. And that would have been, was that the day that you actually talked to Mr. James and Mr. Geary? I believe it was. Okay. Now, let me ask you this, sir. Yesterday you made reference to Mr. Geary and then you said the district attorney. At that time, did you recall Mr. James's name? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, at some point, did Andrea contact you and ask you um, if you were no longer on Skype? No, we were always on Skype. What we did is we had, when Rusty was alive, our Skype was always on and we were always online so that when he was in the mood to call me on Skype, he just dialed me up and my, my machine answered. Okay. Um, and his machine was always on. So if I wanted to talk to him, I could dial him up anytime I wanted to. After he passed away, we decided not to be able to have free access like that without an appointment because we didn't want to be um, in Andrea's house without her permission, without asking. We also didn't want her in our house without her asking. Okay. Um, you did at some point ask that certain mementos from Rusty's youth be provided to you and your wife, right? Some mementos, yes. Yes. And Andrea, in fact, sent a box up to you containing those items, right, sir? She can send some of the things we asked for. Okay. I guess there was a dispute about the high school yearbooks, right? There was, there was a dispute about a lot of things. Okay. Was that, uh, were the items sent up to you prior to your meeting with the district attorney's office in May of 2011? I don't remember when they came. Had there been any sort of dispute with Andrea prior to May of 2011? We had asked for the stuff and got no response. Okay. I understand, sir, but I'm just trying to focus on a particular time period if I can. Was there any dispute that you had with Andrea prior to May of 2011? I don't recall when the dispute occurred. Was there any other dispute? No, there were... There were things that we had given to Rusty and that Rusty had uh, taken from our house that I wanted back. There were some autographed books from a client of mine who wrote the books. Um, there were some other things. And um, okay. Now again, there was an unveiling of Rusty's headstone in, I guess, September of 2011, correct? Yes. And you were not in attendance, is that That's correct? correct. Okay. Um, you came down, obviously, for Rusty's, not Rusty's, Mr. Newman's trunk. Yes. Correct? How long were you in the Atlanta area for during that time, sir? As long as the trial started, from the day it started until the day it ended. Um, have you been in the Atlanta area since, with the exception of matters related to the prosecution of this case? Yes. Okay. Um, so you have been here for reasons other than came down to visit my grandkids. Okay. Um,
Ask non-leading questions, please. Thank you. You may proceed. <clears throat> Tell me if you can, Mr. Snyderman, um, in your own words, about uh, the the issue of seeing your grandchildren and keeping in communication with your grandchildren. We had always we had always talked to the grandkids over Skype as soon as they were probably old enough to comprehend the fact that they were seeing us. In fact, Marilyn and I always talk, joked that the first time Sophia came to see us that we would be three-dimensional and not two-dimensional and we wouldn't, didn't know if she would recognize us. Um, so we always, um, we wanted to keep a, a line open to my, kid, to my grandkids. Um, these are Rusty's kids. They will always be Rusty's kids. What, if any, difficulty have you had in keeping communication with the kids? Um, we now have an agreement that says we talk to the kids on Skype every Saturday morning. Um, calls are short because the kids, you know, they're five and six and seven and that kind of stuff. And they're, they have a short attention span, but we still want to see them. We still want to talk to them. We still want to see that they're growing up and, being, and that they're healthy. Are you complying with the terms of the agreement for visitation? Yes. Is the defendant complying with the terms of agreement for visitation? Um, there was a trip that was scheduled for June for the kids to come to Cleveland, and Andrea said no. Oh. All right. Mr. Clegg also asked you about some of the events that you recall from the trial of <coughs> Yes. Do you recall if there was a dispute about the relationship between Mr. Newman and Ms. Snyderman? Dispute. She said no, there was no relationship, and the argument was that he said, at least in his emails, that there was. Okay. Do you recall if there was a dispute about um, Mr. Newman having imagined a relationship with Andrea? There was some discussion of that. All right. <clears throat> I want to direct your attention to the interview that the defendant did with the police. I think you testified in your presence on November 19th, 2010. Yes. Do you recall Mr. Clegg asking you those questions? Yes. And you recall being present when Andrea spoke with the police? Yes. And had you ever heard the name Hemi Newman before that night? Yes. How had you heard that name? Uh, Rusty had met with him August, September. Uh, Andrea had asked him to meet with him to see if he could find him a job. Um, Mr. Newman was looking to leave GE, and Rusty was trying to help him find a job. Okay. Had he just mentioned that to you at some point? Yeah, he said that they were going to have a lunch and that kind of stuff, and he told me he had forwarded uh, Mr. Newman's resume out to some people that he knew. Let me ask you, after hearing the defendant talked to the police on November 19th, 2010, about her relationship with the defendant. Were you under the impression that there had been a romantic relationship between the two of them? No, there, I'm going to object. What's the objection? Were you, as a leading question, were you under the impression that? And then I'll rephrase it, Your Honor. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Let's rephrase. What, if any, impression did you have or were you left with about the relationship between the defendant and Hemi Newman? The impression I got was that um, he had made a pass at her and that she had said no. Were you under the impression, um, I'm afraid, right. was that the extent or can you tell me the extent that you believe the relationship to be based on what Andrea told the police? That's all I thought it was, it was one pass. And I have to tell you that in the middle of that discussion, Steve arrived from Hawaii and I left the room. Okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Clegg asked you about a number of emails and a number of dates. Um, I want to ask you, what events, specifically phone calls, what phone calls stand out to you when you think about the events when you learned and then in the immediate aftermath of your son's murder? The two, there are two calls. The first call is from Andrea where she said that Rusty was shot. The second call is from when I called the doctor at the Atlanta Medical Center and he said that Rusty had been had come in with multiple gunshot wounds and could not survive. Thank you, Mr. Sainz. Mr. Clegg, any requests? Very briefly. Um, you may ask as many as you wish. Um, 
Did Rusty tell you anything about Andrea's plans to go to Boston on November 22nd? No. Okay. About her plans to start doing contract work for Harvard Business Publishing? After? Yeah, they were talking about whether or not she could sign up for more contract work, but okay. that was still up in the air. Okay. And um, just so I understand, sir, you became suspicious of your daughter-in-law when you found out about the arrest of Hemi Newman, correct? Absolutely. That was on January, January 4th, 2011. And you communicated the contents of this phone conversation on May the 25th of that same year. Is that correct, sir? No, that's when I documented it. You documented it. I wrote, I wrote an email for Mr. Gary to have something in his file. We had talked about it before that. But you don't recall when? Nope. Thank you, sir. Nothing further. Any redirect? Study. Re redirect, Mr. No, you're not. Lawyers, uh, may Mr. Snyderman be released and excuse Mr. Subpoena? Do you want him to remain under subpoena? He may be released by the state, Your Honor. Ms. Clay, step defense. Give me a minute to think that over. Take as much time as you need. Okay. We'll wait right here. Okay. Keller, we're back on the record. Yes, sir? Your Honor, we may need to recall Mr. Snyderman, so I would ask that he not be excused. Right. You'll be excused from coming down, Mr. Snyderman, but you have to remain on the subpoena. Your Honor, may I be heard on that? On whether or not he can come down. <coughs> not whether he may come down. Okay. Let's let him come down. You can come down. You can come down, Mr. Snyderman. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm listening. Your Honor, uh, per a stipulation between the parties, there may be um, an agreement with Mr. about Mr. Simon's presence in the courtroom. And we'd like to take that up, please, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I think it might need to be outside the presence of the jury. Let's do it this way. Lawyers approach. Jeff Hollins, you're back with 11 Alive's continuing coverage of the Andrea Snyderman trial along with defense attorney Will Smith. And we are now looking at Andrea Snyderman uh, as she sits at the table making some notes this morning. Don Snyderman, her former father-in-law, sort of gives uh, an illustration of a very strained relationship with her before uh, and after the murder. And I think that's what uh, the defense was, was trying to show is that he's certainly a biased witness and that um, everything that he's you know, testified to the prosecution comes from somebody that didn't like her from the beginning. And that really taints her testimony. And I think you know, Tom Clegg did a great job of showing that today. What kind of notes do you think she is taking right now as we take a look at her? That's hard to say. Uh, probably something to do with several of uh, the timeline issues that uh, Don Snyderman testified to. Um, maybe something to do with that, that conference call uh, I definitely think that his statement that uh, he wasn't interested in being in that conference call uh, really hurt him when he then went back on it and said that he did try to get involved in it, but he wasn't interested. It just didn't seem very credible to me. At the same time, Don Snyderman trying to show on the witness stand his attention to detail is right. supreme. And, and, I, and I think that uh, you know, the defense did a good job of showing that his attention to detail may be a little selective. but. Uh, at the same time, I, I will give credit to Anna Cross for getting back up there on the prosecution, and I, I think that she made a, a point that you know certain certain details in time uh, were probably less important to him than finding out that his son had been shot, and that made a lot of sense. And I certainly think it did rehabilitate him to some extent. What sort of impact on the jury does it have when he talks about his grandkids that they will always be Rusty's children, and the, the sort of difficulty that they had had? Uh, trying to maintain a relationship with those grandchildren. How does that play with jurors? You know, uh, guessing what a juror is going to think about something uh, requires a mastery that I don't think anybody has <laughs> right now. But I can say that I think it, it, it can cut both ways. We're back on the record. Ms. Cross, anything else? Uh, no, Your Honor, just be asked if this witness be excused to remain in the courtroom for the agreement between the parties. Ms. Petrie? 
That's correct, Your Honor. What is correct? That, that there is an agreement that the witness can remain uh, exempted from the rule of sequestration at this point. All right. I will enforce the agreement that the lawyers agreed to prior to this trial. Thank All you. right. Who's the next witness? Call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. The state calls Alan Schlack to leave. And based on that agreement, Mr. Snyderman may remain. Thank you. Somebody may want to communicate that with me. My name is Alan Shaktely, spelling is A-L-A-N, last name spelling is S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-L-Y. Good morning, Mr. Schwein. Good morning. Uh, where are you employed, sir? I work for General Electric. How long have you been employed with General Electric? Um, since 2002. And in what capacity were you employed with General Electric back in November of 2010? Uh, in November of 2010, I was a uh, process engineer, process improvement engineer. Process improvement engineer? Yes, that's correct. And uh, was your office located here in the Atlanta area? Yes, it was. Where was that? Uh, it was in a building on uh, Powers Ferry Road at 2018 Powers Ferry. Okay. Do you know the defendant in this case? Yes, I do. How do you know her? Uh, we work together. And in terms of your office and her specific office, where were the two in relation to one, of another, one our, another? Our offices were right next to each other in, this, in the uh, 2018 building. And did you have contact with her regularly? Uh, yes, I did. I want you, if you can, to recall the events of November 18, 2010. Okay, do you remember that day? I do. Were you in the office that day? Uh, no, I was not in my office. I was uh, in a training class. Where was the training class being? It was in a different building in our main headquarters building. It's called the 4200 building. Okay, but it was still, say, on the GE, I call it a campus. Is, is that correct? Yes, it was on the GE campus. Okay. Um, do you remember what time your training took place that day? Uh, the training started at 8 a.m. And you were there on time? Yes. Did you see the defendant at all that day? Uh, no, I did not. Did you have any contact with her at all that day? Uh, yes, I did. Um, do you recall about what time you had contact with her? Uh, at approximately 10.30 in the morning. And tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you would, uh, what type of contact you had with her. Uh, I received a text message from Andrea. Um, Where were you when you received the text message? I was in the, my training class. Okay. And when you received the text message from her, um, did you respond immediately? Uh, uh, she had sent a text message asking for me to call her as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I responded back five minutes because I was in training and I was going to wait for a break before I called. So when you say you, re you responded back five minutes, are you saying you responded back within five minutes or five minutes was your response? Five minutes was my response on the text. Okay. And um, did you, in fact, wait five minutes before communicating with her? N uh, no, uh, she sent a second text message to me that said that my husband had been shot. So when you got the text message saying my husband had been shot, what did you do, sir? Uh, I texted back, calling, I got up, walked out of the, uh, of the training class, found a place where I could make a, a phone call, and I called her. Now, the uh, device on which you received these text messages, was it a personal phone? Was it a work phone? It was a GE phone, a, a BlackBerry. GE BlackBerry. And was the communication that you had with the defendant back on the 18th memorialized? Uh, yes. Uh, when I spoke with the investigators mm -hmm. later, uh, they took a picture of it. Okay. Um, I'm going to first, Your Honor, for the record, show counsel what I'll mark for identification purposes as state 57. You may. Thank you. And 58. You may.
May I approach the witness? You may. Mr. Shackley, if you would take a look at what I've marked for identification purposes, it states 57, 58, and tell me if you recognize what's depicted in uh, those photographs, sir. Uh, yes, this is uh, the Blackberry that I had at that time, and what's depicted is a photograph of the text messages that we had back and forth that day. And were those the photographs that were memorialized by the police officers during the time that uh, they interviewed you, sir? Yes, that is correct. And do the photographs in states 57 and 58 fairly and accurately depict the messages as they were displayed on your phone the day you received them from the defendant? Yes, they do. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to admit into evidence states 57 and 58. Any objection? No objection. Hearing no objection, they are admitted without objection. Thank you. You may publish them if you wish. I do, Your Honor. Um, may I approach the You may. Yes. I'm going to ask Mr. Pasquale if he would display them for us. Let's start with the state 57. So you can and look at either that monitor or that monitor, the one behind you. Now, before we start, sir, take a look at States 57 and tell me if you see the exchange that you had with the defendant on the morning of the 18th. Yes, I do. Is it, is it shown in its entirety there in States 57? Yes, it starts with the message, call me ASAP, please. Okay, call me ASAP, please. So would that be the, the message that's right at the very top of the screen underneath, <coughs> underneath another line? That is correct. Okay. Well, why don't you first just read, tell us who the message came from, if you can tell by looking at States 57. So the message came from Andrea Snyderman. And is that what we see at the top of the photograph in, in 57? Yes. And is there a date as to when that message was received? Uh, so the first message came in at 1034 on the 18th date. of November. Uh, November 18th, 2010. Okay. And time? Uh, 1034 a.m. All right, now, the message that you received from the defendant, Andrea Snyderman, on November 18th at 10.34 a.m., it says what, sir? Call me ASAP, please. And the next line is what? Uh, my response was uh, five minutes. And is that when you say you were asking her if it could wait five minutes? Uh, I was essentially expressing that I would call in five minutes. Okay. Um, and then the next line reads what, sir? Uh, my husband was shot. And what did you, what's the next line after that? My response back, calling, and it was at that point that I walked out of the training course and made the phone call. Okay. And when you walked out of the training course and made the phone call, did you in fact speak with her? Yes, I did. And we will get to that in one second, but right after calling, there's another line. That's correct. Did that communication take place during the uh, November 18th date as well? No, it did not. That communication is a subsequent text communication that happened uh, some time later. Okay, so it, it, it had nothing to do with the events of November 18th. That's that correct? correct. All right. Um, so you, you told us that you stepped out of the hall, out into the hallway, and you actually communicated with her. Correct. Can you uh, explain for us what happened in that conversation? Well, my recollection of the phone conversation uh, is essentially that she was uh, communicating to me that she needed to uh, leave and would I make contact with her manager to inform him uh, that her husband had been shot. Okay. And did you agree to do so? Yes, I did. And did you, in fact, contact her manager to let him know? Yes, I did. That her husband had been shot. Okay. If we could please published states 58. Are you able to read states 58, sir? Yes, I can. All right. Um, can you look at states 58 and tell us who that communication was with? Uh, that communication is to Hemi Newman. And the date, please? On November 18, 2010. Time. 10.45 a.m. All right. Um, tell us about the communication you had with Hemi Newman that morning. So I sent that first text message, Hemi, it's Alan Shackley. I need to make contact with you. 
Andrea's had a family emergency that I need to make you aware of. And uh, was that your communication to Hemi Newman? That is correct. So the reason that I express that it is Alan Shackley is the first time I'd ever sent a text message to Hemi, so I wanted to make sure he knew that it was me. Okay, so while you told us you had contact with the defendant quite often, did you have contact with Hemi Newman often? Not often. Okay. Uh, we would be in meetings together periodically, but not on a daily basis. All right. So in this call, you wanted to make sure that he understood that the message was coming from you? That's correct. All right. Um, and did he respond to your text? He did. What did he say? Call my cell. And what did you do, sir? Uh, I, I, at that point, I don't recall. I believe I called him that morning, but uh, I'm, I'm not certain. All right. Now, there's a line underneath that says, call my cell. That's correct. Who is that from? That is from, the, from Hemi Newman. All right. Was that all part of the same text, or was it a back and forth? Do you recall? That was part of the same text. It came oh. shortly after I sent that message. And it says what, sir? The, the, it just says, call my cell. Next oh, line. the second line. So um, she, he, he responded back. I talked to her, and I responded back to his text. Uh, okay, good. That's correct. That's coming from Hemi Newman saying. That's what it says. I just talked to her. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. And so he says, I just talked to her, correct? That's correct. And did you respond? I said, okay, good. So you are in the know. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Was there any more communication that you had with Hemi Newman that day? Uh, not that I recall. Did you have any more communication with the defendant that day? Uh, yes, I did. Um, when did you have further communication with her? Uh, at some point later in the morning, I received uh, a phone call from Andrea informing me that her husband had uh, passed away and again asking for me to let her manager know that she would be uh, uh, out for some time. Okay. So she was able to communicate to her manager through you, is that correct? That's correct. Now, do you know where she was uh, when she first reached out to you? I do not know. Do you know if she had gone to the hospital at that time? Uh, I do not recall. Did she say anything to you that told you where she was at that time? Um, uh, no. We have just one second, Your Honor. Right. Thank you. And I have on just, the record. Thank ahead. you, Your Honor. I'm sorry. We have one, one last question. The BlackBerry that you had with GE, do you recall the phone number? Yes, I do. May I have it, please? The phone number is 404-202-7082. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Who's witness? Mr. Patron, you may cross them if you wish. D16 would be next. Yes, D16 is next. Okay, I'm sorry, may I approach the court reporter? You may. You may approach the court reporter, Kelly Carpenter.
Shaq, again, I'm John Petrie, and you were kind enough to speak with me briefly earlier, so I've got just a few questions for you. Um, when, on a normal work day, if everybody's in his or her office, your and Andrea's offices were fairly close together. That's correct. <coughs> on this day, however, you were in training in another building. That's correct. Do you have any personal knowledge whether or not Andrea was ever at work that day? I do not. Okay. Now, she first texted you, you said, at 1040, correct, sir? Uh, at 1034. That's correct. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I'd ask permission to publish to the jury uh, defendant's exhibit number 16, which is bait stamp number 3273. 3273? Yes, sir. It's right. page of the telephone records that have been stipulated as accurate for uh, Mrs. Snyder. No objection All to right. the state, Your Honor. It will be admitted and it may be published. Can you? That'll be D16. We want to start on that. See if you can focus down Did there. you need a marker to highlight something, or you just want to? Uh, you know what? I well, you don't have to. I, I, don't, just, I was just going to see if he could, if he could in no, blow it up there a little bit. You know what, Your Honor? I'm going to do this. It, the, the document does not lend itself to showing times and everything. I'm going to show this to Mr. Shack. Oh, you if may, I you may approach. Mr. Shack, this has been admitted, sir. Uh -huh. I'm going to ask you with me just to look at this document, which is not one generated by you, but it's been stipulated in, and ask you to look with me at the bottom of this record and see if it shows, uh, starting in, on line 150, if it shows any activity. Oh, okay. I was just going to say... I'm going to object if counsel is going to, I guess, narrate the form and what it means, but I, I have no objection to asking a question right. about the form. If he sees his number on here is what I'm asking. Well, and no sure objection asking, do you yeah. see your number right. on here? Right. I was trying to speed it up since there's about 30 entries yeah. on there. Start with the bottom well, I, of the page. That's what I offer you to highlight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, may I approach you? I'm going to object to a document being placed on. Well, I'm going to say, if you don't mind, sir, if you could remove that. Because he's we looking. One or the other. One or the other. Because that was not highlighted. Is that correct, Mr. Peter? That is not highlighted. The one that was on the screen had highlights on it, so that's a different document. Now, do you see, do you see your telephone number? That? Does the highlighting help you find where that is? Yes, I see my number. Do you see any um, in the column noted originating number? Do you see your number appearing there anywhere, sir? Yes, I do. And in the terminating number, do you also see some as well, sir? Yes, I do. Okay. And again, what was your number at that time, please, Mr. Shackley? 404-202-7082. Let me show you, if I might, what has previously been marked and tendered and admitted the defendant's exhibit number 17 and ask you if you see on this uh, mobility usage chart if you see your number either in the originating number or the terminating number on this page, sir. Yes, I do. And does, does that record reflect what time your telephone made any calls? Yes, it does. And what, what time does it show, please, sir? It would indicate that I placed a call at 10.36 a.m. Okay. And does it show any other calls that you received from Mrs. Snyderman's number, sir? Yes, it does. And does, what time was that, please, sir? It would indicate that I received a call at 10.36 a.m. Okay. Now, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please, Mr. Shackley, what, you, you did not see Mrs. Snyderman that morning. That's correct. You spoke with her on the phone or texted with her, and that's the only communications that you have with her on that morning. Yes. 
Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what her demeanor, what her voice sounded like when you actually spoke to her? Obviously, you can't do that with a text message, but when she spoke to you, what did you notice, if anything, about the way she was speaking? As I recall, she seemed upset. Okay. Do you remember um, uh, speaking with Detectives Boyer and Clifton at the Dunwoody Police Department? Uh, I spoke Sometime later. I spoke with him, but it was not at the police department. It was at the, at the GE headquarters. Okay. Do you remember telling them that she was not making much sense? Uh, uh, yes, I do recall. Okay. And at the time that you told that to the police at the GE headquarters, did you believe that that was an accurate description of her demeanor back on the morning of November the 18th, sir? Yes. Okay. Now, you, I believe I understood you to state that you had not had any further communication with Hemi other than the, Hemi Newman, other than the uh, text messaging or phone calls on that day. Is that correct? Uh, uh, I had additional contact with Hemi that day, yes. Okay, and that, that's, my, that's what I want to ask you. You actually saw him in person later that day, did you not? That is correct. And can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury where that contact was and what happened there, sir? Uh, Following the subsequent communication with Andrea, I went up to Hemi's office uh, and met with him there. We actually stepped out into the hallway next to his office. And did you inform him of what you had learned? Did he inform you of what he had learned? What, what was the nature of that conversation, please, sir? I informed him that I had learned from Andrea that her husband had died, uh, and uh, that was the essential gist of the conversation. Did you or he make any request of the other to let other folks at GE know? Uh, yeah, we had uh, discussed briefly uh, that uh, we needed to talk with human resources to figure out uh, how we should communicate to the rest of the uh, staff. Did Mr. Newman make any comment to you about that that seemed odd at the time to you? Uh, I recall that uh, uh, Mr. Newman was uh, uh, requested that we don't communicate anything uh, right away. Now, when you actually spoke with uh, Mrs. Snyderman on the phone, the, the, the records indicate the total conversation was about 35 or 40 seconds. Is that correct? That's correct. And she told you that her husband had been shot and that she was leaving. That's correct. She did not say, I'm leaving work, did she? Uh, not that I recall. And I believe you're, uh, since you weren't at your office that day, your assumption at the time was, she was leaving work. As I recall, yes. Okay. But that was just an assumption based on, on a normal work day, that's where she's going to be. Correct. You have no personal knowledge as to when she was notified of anything that happened to her husband, correct? Correct. And you have no personal knowledge where she was when she placed that telephone call to you. Correct. You have no personal knowledge as to where she was leaving or where she was going when she had that conversation with you. Correct. She simply stated uh, words to the effect of, my husband's been shot, I'm leaving, please let him be or please let my manager know. Correct. Okay. One moment, please, Your Honor. You may. Take as much time as you need. We're back Mr. on the record. Shackley. Yes, sir. That's all I have of Mr. Shackley, Your Honor. Right. Thank may you I so have much. have my marker back? <laughs> yes, sir. All right. You may approach. <laughs> Is there any redirect? Just one, Your Honor. Ask as many questions as you wish. Thank you. You're welcome. I can do it from here. Mr. Shaft. No, come up to the microphone, please. I'm going to make sure the court reporter can take everything down. Okay. I'm not limiting your questions. Ask as many as you wish. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Shackley, the exchange you had when the defendant said my husband's been shot, what time was that, sir? Well, the phone call happened almost immediately after that set of text messages, so I would assume it was approximately 1036 a.m. That was the phone call. The first time she said to you, my husband has been shot, what time was that? Uh, per the photograph, it was at 1034 a.m. Thank you, sir. Did he recross? Just very, very As many as you wish. Come on Per the back. photograph, that is your, the text message of which we have a photograph here today. That is correct. Okay. At 1034 says, shows us that you got a text message saying that my husband has been shot. Correct. Whether it was a telephone, in-person, text message, email, 
anything like that the first time she mentioned that to you in any form whatsoever was 10.34 in the morning. Correct. That's all I have, Your Honor. Any re-redirect? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right, okay. lawyers, may this witness be released and excuse me, subpoena. No objection. Any objection? No objection. Are uh, you free to go? Have a good day, sir. Call your next witness. Uh, state calls Detective Maldonado. And Your Honor, uh, may I approach one moment? Come on up, lawyers. Thank you. Back to 11 Alive's live continuing coverage of the Andrea Snyderman trial. I'm Jeff Hellinger, joined by Will Smith. We saw a uh, former General Electric employee who worked with Hemi Newman and also Andrea Snyderman just leave the stand, Alan Schachtman. Uh, and he explained that the first phone call that he received from Andrea Snyderman was at 1030 on the day of the murder. And then he notified Hemi Newman, uh, her boss, as directed by her, um, about 1045. And, and it's clear that the prosecution is trying to establish that timeline uh, that started with um, Don Snyderman right, stating you. that he was informed right, sometime around 9.30 by Andrea that, that he was shot. shot. All right, back to the courtroom. Face not be recorded uh, to, to protect him and his life. All right. Bring him in, please, or her in. Bring the next witness in. All right, now, the jurors is indicating they want a break. They're giving me the break sign. I'm going to go ahead and give them a break at this point in time. This what I'm going to do, uh, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, let me go ahead and give you a break. Um, someone told me they needed a break, which is okay. Um, just go ahead and have a seat for a quick second. It's going to be in the neighborhood of 10 minutes. All right, just follow the instructions. The deputy will be a 10-minute break. All right. Okay, so we're going to take about a 10-minute break here. And, Will Smith, this morning we have seen Don Snyderman, and we also have seen uh, Alan Shackley, the former General Electric employee. We will see more witnesses coming up shortly. The weather is uh, a uh, ever-evolving situation, and we are going to get to our weather coverage right now, and you will not miss any of the trial. Uh, after the 10-minute uh, break, it will be back into the courtroom, and we will continue with uh, day three of the evidence portion of the trial of Andrea Snyderman. Along with attorney Will Smith, I'm Jeff Hollinger. Let's join some weather coverage right now.
right, so that picture was taken a third of the way away. Like, if you're looking at this picture, mm -hmm. whoever took this one was standing closer to the left side of this photograph.
everyone. You may be seated. Go ahead and swear, man. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth that we got? I do. They know you have a seat. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Jesus Maldonado, spelled J-E-S-U-S, -S, last name M-A-L-D-O-N-A-D-O. -O -O. Detective Maldonado, where do you work? I'm uh, employed currently with the City of Dunwoody Police Department. All right, and what is your position at the, the Dunwoody Police Department? Uh, currently, I'm uh, assigned to the DeKalb Haida unit, um, undercover unit. And what was your position? Where were you employed in November of 2010? Um, I was employed with Dunwoody Police, and at the time I was assigned to the Criminal Investigative Investigations Unit. Okay, and what sort of things do detectives assigned to the Criminal Investigative Unit do? Um, investigate uh, all sorts of crimes, um, ranging from uh, thefts to murders to assaults. All right. Did you have any involvement in the investigation into the murder of Russell Snyderman? I did. Okay. Can you tell the jurors a little bit, please, about what your involvement with that was? On uh, November 18, 2010, um, I reported to work. Um, as usual, I was working at uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, shortly after I arrived at, uh, at the office, um, I received word uh, through another detective, Detective Thompson, that uh, there was a call about a person that had been shot. Um, initially, the, uh, the call was received as a person shot near a bank. Um, turned on my radio, and the dispatchers updated the call to a person shot um, in the parking lot of a daycare um, located near uh, Dunwoody Village Parkway. Uh, is that within the city of Dunwoody? It is. And is that in DeKalb County? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what, if anything, did you do with this information? Uh, I immediately responded to the scene. And uh, let me ask you, what, um, who else was present at the scene when you arrived? When I arrived, um, DeKalb County Fire and EMS personnel were, were present. Um, was as, that ambulance personnel? Yes. Okay. As well as uh, uniform patrol officers. Okay. Was um, the victim, Rusty Snyderman, still present? Uh, when I arrived, he was. Okay. And how much longer after you arrived was uh, Rusty Snyderman in the ambulance? and personnel that was carried for, caring oh. for him. How long were they still on the scene? Uh, within minutes of me arriving, he was, he was transported away. And do you recall what time this was? I uh, believe I arrived approximately around 9.30 a.m. All right. Did you, how long were you at the scene of the, the shooting that day? Uh, I don't remember exactly. Um, it, was, it was a while. Uh, several and, hours? Um, say a, at least a couple, maybe. Okay. I don't know exactly. In the time that you were at the scene, did um, did you encounter the defendant at all? I did. Okay. And do you know the defendant? Uh, personally, no. Okay. Had you ever no. seen her or recognized her anywhere uh, before you saw her on November eighteenth? No. Prior prior to the eighteenth, I have no, I had never seen her ever. Okay. Please describe for the jurors what you were doing when you encountered the defendant. Um, the crime scene was already established, set up with crime scene tape. Explain to the jury what that is or what that means. Um, basically, we seal off an area um, where the crime occurred um, to preserve evidence and to work, uh, process the scene. I'm called crime scene investigators come process the scene. So the area was roped off with yellow crime scene tape, um, just like the ones you see on TV that say crime scene do not enter. Why is it that a, a scene is roped off with crime scene tape like that? Um, so the only people who are allowed to be in that crime scene are the people who are working it, um, investigators, uh, crime scene technicians, um, anyone, law enforcement personnel related. What about bystanders or civilians? Is anyone uh, allowed inside the tape? No, ma'am. Okay. What about witnesses to a crime? Are they allowed inside the tape? Uh, no, ma'am. All right, so when the, def tell me then, uh, how, how did you encounter the defendant? Um, I, uh, as the crime scene was being worked, um, I looked up and saw a black um, sport utility vehicle um, entering um, the parking lot of the daycare. Um, the vehicle was 
traveling um, into the daycare towards the crime scene tape. Um, at that point in time, I made my way towards to where the, the tape started and uh, observed the car stop and a uh, female exit uh, the vehicle. Did the car, was it parked in a parking space? Um, at the time that it came to rest, it was, it was not. And can you estimate for me how far away from that actual scene of the shooting was the SUV that you described uh, when it stopped? Um, the way the, the crime scene tape was set up on this particular side, um, it was roped off at a stop sign. Um, obviously, it's all on private property. And um, the vehicle was stopped before the tape, um, before the stop sign. You want to may I push the witness? You may. Detective Maldonado, I'm showing you what has been previously marked as State's Exhibit Number 56. Do you recognize what State's Exhibit Number 56 is? I do. What is that? Uh, it's a photograph of the stop sign with the crime scene tape and my assigned detective vehicle on the other side of the tape. Okay, and is that the, the scene, the portion of this, the crime scene that you were just describing for the jurors? Yes. And does that photo, State's Exhibit Number 56, does that fairly and accurately depict the crime scene tape and the scene as you described it, as you found it, on November 18, 2010? Yes, it does. Your Honor, State moves to admit State's uh, 56 in evidence. In objection, Your Honor. All right, there's no objection heard. May I publish it to you the may. jury? You may. Thank you. Hand me that back. Let me publish it to the jury. Thank you, Your Honor. Looking at the monitor, can you describe for the jurors, please, what we're seeing in State's Exhibit Number 56? Uh, the white four-door sedan is was my assigned detective vehicle at the time. I'm going to walk over here on the large display, and I'm going to point to what I think you're talking about. Is this the four-door sedan that you're talking about right here? Yes, it's a Ford Fusion. Okay, that's your car. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what else? I think you can touch that screen and trigger the monitor. Oh, that is cool. Okay. Can I test it? Yeah, you can test it. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right, that's your car. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And where was the SUV as it pulled up in relation to your car and the, what we're looking at, State's Exhibit Number 56? Um, from what I remember, it was a little bit further back around, I guess you can see where I made the marks there, um, but I believe it was a little further out, out of view of what this picture Okay, farther shows. back from, from where your car yeah, Just Just a little bit further back from where it was, okay. from what I remember. All right. And on this picture, picture, can you tell us just directionally where where is the crime scene? Where where is the um, the scene of the crime? Scene? Um, there's two entrances to this daycare uh, facility. Um, there was a side entrance, and then there's a main entrance. The main entrance is to the left of this curb, on that side where I've marked it blue. Um, the side entrance is on the right side of the curb, closer in. Uh, the victim's uh, vehicle was parked on the right side of the curb. You may I push the witness? You may. Detective Maldonado, I'm showing you what has been marked as State's Exhibit Number 55. Do you recognize State's Exhibit Number 55? I do. What is it? It's a uh, photograph um, that shows the uh, side of the uh, Dunn Woody Prep School. Um, basically the right side of that curb along, that, along a wall. There's a brick wall and then there's the building. And does State's Exhibit Number 55, does that fairly and accurately depict the side of the, the daycare where the shooting took place as you encountered it on November 18th, 2010? Yes, it does. Your Honor, the State moves to admit State's Exhibit Number 55 in evidence. Any objection? No, sir. I just made it without objection. May I publish it to the you jury? May. Thank you. All right. I'm going to put this up on the camera. I'm going to ask you to use the very cool screen in front of you and let the jurors know what it is that we're looking at. Tap it on the bottom. Be sure to erase what you have there. Okay, yeah, it's gone. Um, the silver vehicle here um, is the victim's vehicle. Um, there's a front end of a marked patrol unit there. Um, from where the picture was taken, um, if you're referring back to Exhibit 56, Six. Uh, it was from that area, but to the right facing left. So where the crime scene was and when the, where the woman who pulled up in the SUV arrived, it was even further away from the perspective in this, um, in this photo? Yeah, a little bit further back. Okay. 
All right, you pointed out the victim's vehicle. Can you um, identify that for me again, please? Um, this silver vehicle uh, parked here, it's a, uh, it was an Infiniti, I think it was a G35. Okay. At the time you encountered the woman who pulled up in the SUV, was, was that car still there? Uh, I can't recall. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it was there or not if at that time. Or not there? Okay. If you can recall, was the uh, victim, Rusty Steinerman, was he still present on the scene? No, ma'am. Okay. What about the ambulance that had been caring for him? Was the ambulance still on the scene? No, ma'am. Okay. What would have been visible to you and to the woman uh, from your perspective as she drove up in the SUV, stopped at the crime scene tape? Uh, from from where the, the crime scene tape was, if the, if the victim's vehicle was still present, um, that, that could have been seen from where, she, where it was parked. Were there any crime scene markers up, any placards, anything like that, that would indicate evidence at the scene that you recall? Not to my knowledge. Can you approximately tell sure. me what time it was that you encountered the woman who pulled up in the SUV? Um, roughly, maybe between 15 and 30 minutes, and that's a rough guesstimate. 15 to 30 minutes after you arrived? Uh, roughly. Okay. And you told me that you arrived at what time? Around 9.30 a.m. Okay. So somewhere between 9.45 and 10 a.m.? Uh, more uh, or less. Very approximately. Yeah, okay. not exactly. <laughs> sure. All right. <laughs> so tell me then about your encounter with, with the woman. Did you approach her or did she approach you? Um, well, when the vehicle came to rest, she got out and came towards the crime scene tape area, and um, we kind of met each other. Um, okay. You told me that you didn't know the defendant. Do you recognize uh, the defendant now as anyone that you had seen before? Um, I do now. Okay, and who do you recognize the defendant to be? Uh, Miss Andrea Snyder. Okay, and is that the person you encountered on November 18th, 2010? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And can you describe or point her out uh, what she's wearing today? Um, she's a white female. She's got brown hair, and she's wearing a, uh, I believe that's a pinkish shirt, blouse. Is that more salmon? Salmon. Salmon blouse. <laughs> Regulate so reflect he's identified a defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, what, uh, what happened next? What did you do next? Um, uh, the vehicle came to an abrupt stop. Um, she exited the car. Um, we made contact. Um, we pretty much were kind of, she was running towards the crime scene, and I was coming to make contact with her before she came into the crime scene. Um, at the time, I did, I did not know who she was at that moment. Um, did she identify herself to you in any way? Uh, not that I recall. Was she identified to you by anyone else there at the scene? Um, at the scene, someone, and I, I don't know who, uh, mentioned that uh, something along the lines of, that must be the wife. Um, and that was the only thing that I heard. Um, I assume that it, they were speaking of the wife of the victim because we knew that he had just dropped off a child at the daycare facility. Uh, you were anticipating or someone was anticipating that, that someone had been notified, a family member or friend of the victim? Um, at that point in time, it appeared that somebody, that a close relative had been notified. I wasn't completely sure if that was the wife or not at that time. Okay, all right. And when you say you encountered her, can you look on state's exhibit number 56? And tell me if that picture um, can give you any direction or let the jurors know where it was that you encountered this woman. Um, it was around this area along the line of the crime scene tape. Okay, somewhere in the general area? Somewhere in the general area, yes, ma'am. Not any closer to the crime scene? Uh, no, that was it. Okay. All right, then tell me about your interaction with the defendant. Um, as she exited the vehicle, she um, was kind of running towards the crime scene. Um, I was running towards her to make sure that they didn't come in the crime scene. And um, at that point... You said they. Was the defendant Oh, alone? no, I'm sorry, her. Okay. Yeah, she was alone. <laughs> and um, uh, we made contact. Um, she asked me several times, um, what's going on? What's happening? What's going on? What's going on? Um, it appeared that she was in some sort of state of panic or shock. Um, and I, uh, I was just consoling her in, in a sense of just telling her to calm down, please calm down, please calm down. Um, let me ask you anything about the defendant's, um, the defendant's um, physical description. Was she, was she wearing um, any sort of corrective lenses that you could see? Uh, she was wearing glasses. Okay. Um, and you described her demeanor. Did you approach her on your own or was there someone else with you? Um, when I initially approached her, I was, I was alone. 
And what, if anything, beyond what you just told the jury, did you tell the defendant right there when you encountered her? Uh, just to calm down, to calm down. And um, I was trying to hold her up. Uh, there was a point in time that she kind of collapsed a little bit. Um, and I was just, didn't want her to fall on the concrete, so I was just trying to hold her up. And uh, during that time, I was just trying to console her to tell her to calm down. Okay. Um, did there come a time where you and the defendant uh, went to any other location beyond what we're looking at here in yes. exhibit number 56? Yes, ma'am. Um, I knew that my sergeant at the time um, was inside of the daycare facility. And, um, Who was your sergeant at the time? Uh, his name's uh, Gary Cordellino. And uh, I wanted to walk her out of that open area um, away from the public eye to a more secure location, which the closest was the inside of the daycare facility. Okay, so is that where you took her? Uh, yes, that's where I walked with her to the front entrance. Okay. Uh, can you estimate for me how long it was that you spent with the defendant from the time you were first encountered her when she, when she pulled up in her SUV to the time that you escorted her inside the daycare center? Um, minutes. I mean, it... And during those minutes, Detective Maldonado, did you tell her that her husband had been shot? I did not. Did you mention anything about a victim being shot? No, ma'am. Did you mention anything about a shooting in the area? No. What information did you relate to her that at that point um, you communicated to her? Uh, during our interaction, I, the only thing that I was telling her was to calm down, to relax. Um, and was trying to get her to walk. I said, you got to stand up. you got to walk with me. We're going to go in the building. We're going to go in the building. Just calm down. Relax. Did she ask to see your husband? I do not recall. Detective okay. Maldonado, um, were you asked to review any other piece of evidence in preparation for your trial today? I was. Okay. What was that piece of evidence that you were asked to review? It was a um, video that was uh, taken from a security camera at the daycare facility. And did you review that? I did. Okay. May I approach the witness? You're right. Detective Maldonado, I'm showing you what has been marked as State Exhibit number 60. Do you recognize State Exhibit number 60? I do. What do you recognize it to be? Uh, it's a uh, DVD of uh, the uh, security video from the daycare. And how do you know what the contents of that are? Um, I, was, I viewed it and I signed off on it. That's your signature on it? Yes, ma'am. And it was dated? Uh, yes, it was dated 8 6 of 2013. Okay. And in your review of um, the video that's contained in State's Exhibit number 60? 60, yes. 60. Uh, is that a fair and accurate representation of the interaction that you had with the defendant on November 18, 2010? It was. Okay. Your Honor, State moves to admit State's Exhibit number 60. Any objection? No, sir. No objection. Maybe public. Mm -hmm. admit it without objection. Thank Maybe you. <clears throat> Is this audio and visual or just visual? It's just visual, Your Honor. Right. And I'm going to ask Detective Maldonado if you can let me know when you first see you or the defendant on, on the video. And I'll ask Mr. Pascal to pause it at that time. Is that right, your stop it? Um, the other side where the walls come together there, um, it appears uh, that I am with uh, Ms. Snyderman at that time. Uh, the gentleman, I believe, that's walking in front is a, uh, was a lieutenant uniform patrol. All right, you made a small blue mark, and I appreciate that. I wonder if you could make it a little larger so that the jury can see um, the video. It, thank you. Mm -hmm. And you and the defendant are where? Uh, right where that blue mark is. Okay. So where is the, where's the um, crime scene tape that we were looking at in State's Exhibit number 56? Um, from what I can see on the video, it's hard to tell from the, where the, it says converter. It looks like the curb goes up this way. Mm -hmm. And the crime scene tape was up around there because that's where the, ent the entrance comes in from here, from Mount Vernon Road. I see. And then there's, uh, the crime scene tape is in between okay. there. All 
Um, Can you stop it? I'm on the, that's me here on the left. Um, uh, the black silhouette here is uh, Miss Snyderman. Um, I believe she was wearing, a, you can call it a business suit. It was a long skirt with a uh, black top. And uh, I'm escorting her towards the entrance of the daycare, which is right here. Um, the gentleman that was walking ahead of me, um, his name is Lieutenant William Hegwood. He's also with Dunwoody Police. He was the lieutenant on duty at the time. Um, during this time, um, I'm telling Ms. Natterman to calm down. Um, she, we were walking, she stopped. And then during that time, I was just telling her, we got to keep walking, we got to keep walking, just trying to calm down. I don't see any other law enforcement or detectives or, or anyone else around you. Did you have, or when you encountered the defendant, was there anybody else who was around her? Uh, when I initially encountered her, uh, no. I mean, Lieutenant Hegwood was in the area, but he was walking ahead of us. Uh, were you with the defendant for the entire time that she was outside I, in the parking lot? I was. Right, and did anyone else have a conversation with her? Uh, while you were present? No. Did anybody else have a conversation with her beyond, besides you at the time she was outside the scene? Um, at the time that I was in, in contact with her, uh, no one else had uh, contact with her. Um, the, there was another set of contact that was made after I left her at the entrance to the daycare facility, and that's when she was taken inside by, I believe it was two employees uh -huh. of the Did daycare. You no. I. Uh, if you saw the video, the last clip of it, once I handed her over, um, I turned around and walked in back towards the crime scene with the lieutenant. time of the video, what we just saw, had any other family member, Detective Maldonado, showed up or appeared at the crime scene that you're aware of? Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Let me ask you, why is it um, that you are so sure that you didn't mention or um, tell the defendant that there had been a shooting or her husband had been shot? Um, well, considering um, her reaction when she arrived at the scene and uh, the way that we police officers are supposed to do death notifications or notify any person of any traumatic event involving one of their loved ones. Um, the time and place that our encounter was, was not, didn't make any sense. Um, and you saw on the video the way that she was reacting. There was no way that I was going to tell someone that they just lost a loved one in a parking lot of from where she was. Thank you. Mm -hmm. From the vantage point where a defendant pulled up in her SUV, was there any way that it was, um, it was obvious or clear what specifically had happened there at the scene? Um, n not really. Um, y there's no, when you pull up at the scene, you know, all you see is cars parked in the parking lot. Um, you know, obviously there was some police activity and you see the crime scene tape, um, but as far as having any sort of direct indication as to what occurred there, it, it would be hard. <laughs> Thank you, Detective. Yes, ma'am. I have no further questions. You may cross-examine if you wish. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Detective Maldonado, my name is John Peach, and I've got a few questions for you, sir. Yes, sir. You indicated that the defendant, when she drove up, she drove up in a black SUV. Did I understand you to say that she pulled up and parked very close to where your uh, detective unit was? Uh, in the general area, from what I recall. With, with, in the general, how many car lengths from your car? Rough, if you can recall. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, More than 10? Fewer than 5? Can you give us uh, your uh, best recollection? Not a guess, but your best recollection. My best recollection, um, maybe less than 10. Now, you testified just a few minutes ago that, bear with me just one second. Take your time. That, I think I wrote this down right, that when 
she drove up, you stated that you, quote, kind of met each other. Well, the way, yeah, kind of met, meaning that she wasn't standing there while I was walking towards her. Um, she got out of the car and we, it was kind of like I was going towards her and she was coming towards the scene at the same time. But you didn't just kind of meet, she fell into your arms, didn't she? Well, when she got out of the car, we met and then she, we had our interactions, correct? Answer my question, please. Did she okay. or did she not fall into your arms? She did. Okay. Now, when she got out of that car, you were not by yourself, were you? When she got out of the car? Yes, and you met her and first encountered her. Wasn't Officer or Detective Fladrick, if I'm pronouncing that right, with you? I don't remember him being with me okay. at there. What number is this, please, please ma'am? 17? Let me show you a document, sir. Okay. I'm going to show you this document. Yes, sir. You may have broke. Thank you, sir. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to show you this document. I'm going to ask you, first of all, to just look at it in general, see if you can identify what it is. Don't tell us yet any content, okay. and then I'm going to ask you to direct your attention to the last two paragraphs on the second page, and I've got some questions for you. Now, just let me know if you will, please, sir, when you've had a chance to review it. At this time, other than the nature of the document, the only things I need you actually to review would be those last two paragraphs. Okay. When you finish reading, look up. Okay. Uh, I do not remember Lieutenant Flatterick being next to me during the encounter with Ms. Snyderman. If, in fact, Lieutenant Flatterick reported that he was, would you have any reason? Objection. Yeah. What's the objection? Uh, object to the relevance of someone else's recollection or referring this witness to somebody else's report. I, uh, well, I, well, first of all, is the objection that he, are you objecting to him looking at the report now? No. Because he's since looked at it. He did, and if it, if it had refreshed his recollection, then I would have no objection. So what's the objection? That the witness re recollection was not refreshed, and I object to... I'm sorry, I keep... I, I, I object to the form of the question. Well, I, we don't know what the form of the question was, John, because I didn't get to finish it. I agree with that. Finish the question. <laughs> and you may even want to remain standing, because once he finishes, if you don't make an objection, there's going to be an answer, so... That's the way it works. There's no objection right now, so finish your question. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Maldonado, if in fact there were a report from Lieutenant Flad Fladrick, is that Fladrick, yes. Fladrick, indicating that he was there with you when you first encountered Mrs. Snyderman and witnessed her fall into your arms, my question is simply, would you have any reason to dispute that he in fact was there? Uh, if, if he notated it, then, then he was. I mean, but I don't remember him being next to me during that time. And That's what I was testifying to earlier. Okay, I'm not asking you to guess, but you, you have no reason to dispute that if, in fact, that was the report. No, sir. And you stated that when she arrived, she was in what you described as a state of panic or shock. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And had, um, have you been a uniform officer as well? I, yes, sir. How long were you a uniform officer? Uh, roughly f five years. Okay, what, what agency or agency? Um, I worked for the city of Marietta Police Department okay. from 04 to 09 before I came to Dunwoody. Am I correct in my belief that probably as a uniform officer as opposed to a detective, you encountered more people in panic or shock or reacting immediately after a traumatic experience? Would that be correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So you have, in fact, in your capacity as a uniform officer, witnessed people in shock 
impact reacting to traumatic experiences. That's correct. Multiple times. Yes, sir. She kept asking, what's happened, what's happened, words to that effect. Yes, sir. You did not tell her what had happened, correct? I did not. To the best of your knowledge, no other officer or person from the school or bystander, EMS technician, fireman, detective, nobody else, to your knowledge, told her what happened there. I can't speak for anybody else. That you heard. But from what I've, my encounter with Ms. Snyderman, I did not tell her what happened. But, but my question is, did you hear anybody else tell her? Not at that time. Okay. And, and that, that's the time we're talking about. Yeah, did not hear anybody tell her. You walked her up to the, essentially the door of Dunwoody Prep and some, some women who worked there or who came from inside took her the rest of the way. Is that correct? Yes, there was two workers and sar uh, my uh, detective sergeant, Sergeant Cordellino. Okay, Gary Cordellino was inside, came outside, and the two women who may or may not have worked there came out, hugged her and took her inside, correct? That's correct. And during the time that you were with her, did she ever inquire about anything other than essentially what has happened, what has happened? Um, from what I recall, she just asked me that question over and over again. Okay. What's going on? What happened? What happened? Now, in the video, there's a scene where the two of you stop, correct? Yes, sir. And it's a little difficult to tell how long that is from the video because I'm not sure that it's really in real time. Would you agree with that? that seemed to be a little herky-jerky, the video itself. Oh, herky-jerky meaning the quality of the video? No, 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 no. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't have, it, it's, not a, it's not like, H, it's not Blu-ray quality. Exactly. You're yes. not seeing every movement that you and she made there. But, but I can agree with that. Okay. okay. Now, when it, it appears that when you stop, that she is literally, her knees are going out and that you are holding her up. Can you tell us what was being said by you or by her at that time? If you can, was anything being said? At that time, when her knees began to give out, um, I was holding her up. I kept telling her, you gotta get up, you gotta get up. Just relax, just calm down, you gotta get up. We were almost to the front door. I was trying to get her there in one piece. And that was difficult, was it not? It was hard. One moment, please. You may. We're back on the record. Yep. Well, you may. Pardon, Your Honor. And we're back on the record. And, you yes, sir, and I have no more questions for Mr. Maldonado. Thank you so All much, right. sir. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. All right, lawyers, may this witness be released and excuse Ms. Penn. Yes, from the state, Your Honor. No Any objection? objection? Uh, right. Your Honor, I, I apologize. I continue to interrupt you when you, you're asking whether or not there's an objection. I always jump it up to that. Right. There is no objection. I do apologize for jumping to that answer. No problem. You may come down, sir. You're free to go. Drive safe. We call your next witness. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Your Honor, the state calls Detective Andy Thompson. And is he in a um, cover capacity also that I didn't uh, know about? No, Your Honor. You know what? Not that I'm aware of. Well, if you're not aware of him, you're yeah. not asking? No, no I'm he not He can be videotaped. Your Detective Andrew Thompson, A-N-D-R-E-W. Last name is T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. He's been sworn. He's with you. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Thompson, where are you employed? The Dunwoody Police Department. In what capacity? 
as a detective. How long have you been with the Dunwoody Police Department? Since its inception in uh, 2009. Since 2009? Did you work in, in law enforcement prior to joining Dunwoody? I did. I spent approximately eight years with the Atlanta Police Department. Eight with the Atlanta Police Department? Yes, ma'am. What capacity did, did you work in uh, at the Atlanta Police Department? The last one to two years, I was a uh, detective. Um, and when I left Atlanta, I was with the narcotics unit. Okay. Were you employed with Dunwoody uh, Police Department back in November of 2010? I was. And so were you assigned to work a homicide involving a victim by the name of Russell Snyder? I was. Were you the sole officer working that case, or were there other officers assigned as well? The entire uh, CID unit, uh, Criminal Investigations Division, was assigned to work the case, as well as assistance from patrol. Okay. So there were, when you say the entire CID unit, mm -hmm. Um, how many people are we talking? Uh, five detectives, one sergeant. Five detectives and one sergeant. Yes, ma'am. And as it related to the other five detectives and the one sergeant, what was your role in the investigation? Uh, sergeant Corlino made me the lead investigator for the homicide. All right. So when you say you were made the lead investigator, what does that mean? Explain to the jury what you would have to do as the lead investigator. Right. Uh, in theory, what the lead investigator is, he's the focal point for all the information in a criminal investigation. Um, anybody who's assisting in the investigation will go out, get information, funnel it back to the lead investigator. The lead investigator then decides what the priority of the investigation is for the information that he's receiving. He delegates out the People are assisting him to follow up on further investigative details while the lead investigator handles what he feels are the most promising leads for the investigation. Okay, and is it fair to say that the lead investigator is sort of the coordinator? Correct. Right. Now, had you been a lead investigator with Dunwoody at this point uh, on any other homicides? No, ma'am. Right, this so was my first. This was the first. Now, I want to talk to you about the homicide investigation involving Rusty Steinemann. Okay. Uh, where, where did the homicide take place, sir? At uh, the Dunwoody um, School in uh, the Dunwoody Village area. Dunwoody School? <coughs> um, Dunwoody Prep. It's uh, for younger kids. Okay. Daycare center? Daycare center. Thank you. Did you respond to Dunwoody Prep? on the morning of November 18th? A uh, call went out on the radio that uh, shots were fired. Um, it initially came out as a bank in the Dunwoody Village area, and there was a description of a suspect vehicle in the last known direction of it. So I went to a intersecting point to sit and wait to see if the suspect vehicle would come by me. Let me stop you for a moment. The yes, suspect vehicle, what do you mean by that? There was a description of a, a silver minivan okay. that was possibly involved with it. So I went to a point that I thought would be in front of where that van might be going to at the time that the radio uh, made the broadcast on it. Um, I arrived and sat there for, it wasn't a very long time until when Sandy Springs PD showed up. They were assisting us in trying to find the suspect vehicle. When they arrived at the location, I then went to the Dunwoody Daycare Center to assist with the investigation. So let me ask you. You went to a location to see if you would see the, the, the silver minivan. Correct. Did you encounter a silver, silver minivan at no. all that morning? Give us an approximation, or if you know, the time that you arrived to the location. Uh, I don't know the time I arrived, but when I did arrive, uh, Rusty had already been transported from the scene. And the uh, crime scene tape was up, and there was uh, several people there um, interviewing, doing initial interviews with witnesses on the scene. So let me just ask you this. In your experience as a detective, yes, ma'am. when um, a detective is assigned to a case, is it, is it normal for, say, the uniform officers to respond first yes. to the scene? Yes. Typically, the uniform officers will be the first to get to the scene because they're already out in the field um, answering 911 calls. And do they take any action before the detective generally would get there? 
they will set up the crime scene tape to preserve where the crime scene area is. Okay, and was that done by the time that you had arrived? Yes, it was. You told us when you arrived at the scene, Mr. Snyderman was not there, is that correct? That's correct. Were there any ambulances on scene at all? No. So what did you do once you arrived to the scene? Uh, once I arrived at the scene, Sergeant Coralino told me he was going to assign the homicide to me. And so at that point, I looked over the crime scene to see what there was. Uh, the crime scene technicians were not on scene yet, so I made sure that they were en route. Let me stop you. Yes. The crime scene technicians were not on scene yet. Correct. Tell us who the crime scene technicians are as it relates to an investigation. What a crime scene technician does is they basically process a crime scene. In general, um, the lead investigator will show up after patrol shows up. The, patrol, the initial responding officer will tell the, lead, tell the detective what they have found on the crime scene, including any witnesses they spoke to. Then I would decide if a crime scene technician needs to come out. If it does, once a crime scene technician comes out, I walk them through the crime scene, pointing out evidence that I found, and then I leave the scene and everything is left to the crime scene technician to research the scene, look for evidence, mark it uh, with numbers, with however they want, need to mark it, take pictures, measurements. And once they do their investigation of the crime scene, they report back to the lead detective as to what they found, where things were found, and the detective then takes that information and incorporates it into the investigation, however, the in whatever the crime is and however he sees appropriate. Okay, so uh, when you say they, they mark it and, and, and measure yes. the scene, that's done after you, the detective, leave the scene? It could be while I'm there or after I leave. Now, when you arrived at Dunwoody, you, you just told us that the crime scene technicians were not there. Correct. So were there or were there not any, any markings or measurements or any indications of any evidence of a crime that had occurred? when you got there? I don't remember seeing any markings um, pointing out anything specific on the crime scene. Okay. Do you know or recognize the defendant in this case? Yes, I do. And how do you know or recognize the defendant? Uh, she is the uh, wife of the victim, who, the, the person who was shot, Rusty Snyderman, and I had the occasion to interview her several times. Okay. And if you would just identify an, an item of clothing that she's wearing today for the record. Please. Yes, uh, she's wearing a, uh, she's at the defense table wearing a pink shirt, long blonde hair. Your Honor, may the record reflect that uh, Detective Thompson has identified the pink shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, yes, the record may so reflect, uh, yes. Thank you, Judge. All right. Um, when you arrived at the scene, was the defendant at the scene? No, she was not. Okay. Did you speak with her at all? No, I did not. At the scene? Not at the scene. Did you ever have an opportunity to observe her at the scene? I did. Um, the I f first time I saw her is when she got out of her vehicle and started screaming, I can't remember exactly what she was screaming, she was being very loud, very um, dramatic about what was going on. I made an assumption that she's probably related in some way to the person who was shot. Okay. Now, let me stop you. How, how close or how far, what was the distance between you and the defendant at that time? And you can just relatively tell us, was she close, was she far? Well, less than 40 yards. Okay, when you say 40 yards. Well, let's see, um, she was probably no further than for me to the double doors in the back of the room. Okay, Your Honor, if the record could reflect that the officer has pointed to the doors that are, how far would you? I would have to get, get a measuring tape. That's well, the record 40 record feet more. to double doors in the courtroom. <laughs> That's fine with me, just thank you. <laughs> when, uh, so she was about that distance from you? <coughs> Approximately. 
Was she allowed inside of the crime scene? No. Did she ever come close to the crime scene? <laughs> she was parked right up to the uh, crime scene tape. And, and that was, at that location, it was a little bit further than the, uh, the second set of double doors behind that. And are you referring to the doors that are beyond the set of double doors that you That's you correct. Just identified? That's correct. So there's an interior set, Is and it there's an exterior set. Right, she was a little bit further than the exterior set of doors. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> While you were at the scene, Detective Thompson, did you have an occasion to speak to any of the victim's family members? Yes, her um, mother and father arrived on the scene. Um, they came up to the crime scene tape and were about to come under it. I went over to them and said, you, know, you can't come in here. Uh, and they told me who they were. Now let me stop point. you. You said her mother and father. Who's mother uh, and mother? Andrea Snyderman's okay. mother and father. Did they come at the same time that she arrived? After. After. And you said they were about to come under the crime scene tape. Correct. Were you able to stop them? Yes. When they were about to come under the crime scene tape, was Rusty's body there? No. Were there uh, crime scene te technicians out at that time? I don't believe so. And to your knowledge, was any information given to the family about the victim's condition? No. I told them that uh, Rusty had been hurt, but that was the extent of the information I told them. Okay. And when you say, when you say, they, excuse me, when you say they, she's talking about two different transactions. Okay. Who's they? The mother and father, Andrea Snyderman's mother and father. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Um, and as the Justice said, you, you were talking about the mother and father. Did you ever give the, the defendant any information about Rusty's condition? I did not give Andrea any information. Okay. Were there any witnesses at the scene when you arrived? Yes, there were uh, three eyewitnesses and the initial doctor from the pediatrician clinic a few doors down that um, had tried to resuscitate Rusty. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to speak to the witnesses that were at the scene? I spoke to uh, the three witnesses briefly at the scene to find out what they knew and if it was worthwhile to have them uh, come in later for a more in-depth interview as to what they saw. Um, they did have significant information, so I collected their contact information. So I'll be um, asking if they would be available later that day to come in and speak. And they gave me the information, and I made the arrangements. Okay. So when you say they have significant information, uh, how do you determine what's significant and what's insignificant in an investigation at that stage? Anybody who specifically witnesses the crime is, has significant information. And were one or all three of these witnesses individuals who had witnessed the crime? All three um, had witnessed the crime in some fashion. And uh, were you able to get a description from the witnesses of the, of the individual responsible? Yes, I did. Were you also able to learn um, what happened to the victim? From the, from, the from, the, from the witness's description and from what was on the crime scene tape, I had a good idea as to what happened that day. Okay. When you spoke to the witnesses, did any of them get a good look at the face of, well, let me back up and just ask you, when you spoke to the witnesses, did they tell you what they saw? Yes, and all three had a had some description of what the shooter looked like. So you, you just said shooter. Did you learn that there was a shooter at the scene? I did. And uh, you were able to get a description? I was able to get a description. Uh, what, did they get a good look at the shooter? Yes, ma'am. And was the face obstructed in any way as far as uh, the investigation revealed? Um, everybody had a clear view of the shooter, Hemi Newman. Um, at the scene, they, uh, two of the witnesses saw him uh, walking up to Rusty, shooting him, and then walk back to the minivan and take off. Do you know, uh, you just identified the shooter as Hemi Newman. Uh, do you know whether or not Hemi Newman 
had uh, any facial ha hair or anything at the right. time. He was wearing a beard. <laughs> was it a natural beard? It was a fake beard. Okay. You also told us earlier that you had a description of a silver minivan. Um, did you get information about the van as well from the witnesses? And all the witnesses described the uh, a silver minivan with it, and then in addition to that, we were able to recover video from the daycare center that corresponded with what the witnesses described and identified the minivan. So uh, you actually were able to obtain video from the daycare center with footage of the van on it? That's correct. And what, if anything, did you do with the footage of the van? I kept playing the video over and over again, saying that there's got to be something on this van to distinguish it from any, any other van. And I was eventually able to, once I put it on a big screen, um, I found a uh, sticker on the windshield that was very commonly used for the rental car companies to establish that it was a rental car. So at that point, um, I took various still photos from the video that showed the grill of the vehicle, the hubcaps of the vehicle, various design specifics of that vehicle and brought it to several dealerships to see if they could advise me if this was their car or not, what was it, could they tell me the year, all that kind of thing. And were you able to narrow it down to the type of vehicle? Uh, year, make, and model. And um, were you actually able to locate the van that you saw in the footage? Yes, we actually were able to find it. Um, we had assistance from the DA's office, their investigators, um, our supervisors, our detectives, and the um, rental car company. I can't remember which rental car company it was. Um, the rental car company would advise us whenever, actually even before that, we went to Kia headquarters, we called Kia headquarters out in California, and they provided us a list of all year make and model specific of, to this vehicle that had been sold that year. And it only came up with a list of, I think, approximately 1,600 vehicles. And only a very much smaller portion of that was actually sold in Georgia. And out of the ones in Georgia, there were fewer that were privately purchased and some that were corporate purchased for rental car companies. And we went out to every person in Georgia, including uh, South Carolina, that had purchased this vehicle and to interview them to see if they were in the area they could have been there. We dismissed um, everybody that privately purchased the vehicle and then we focused primarily on the rental vehicles. That's how we came up with the, uh, I think it was Enterprise. Um, had these vehicles in their fleet and they would notify us whenever this particular um, your make model van was returned to their business. And once they notified us, the uh, rental comp company held the vehicle at that particular office. We went out there to look at it. Um, everybody who went out had pictures of the van and they tried to match it up. If it didn't match, we crossed it off and we eventually found the van with the stickers in the appropriate locations on the windshield up, I believe it was in Canton. In Canton, Georgia? In Canton, Georgia. Um, and Canton being just, I guess, north of uh, it's north uh, County, Marietta area. Um, once you were able to kind of narrow down that van, what did you do next? Well, we impounded the van for further investigation. Um, we had it processed, I believe the, I can't remember if we processed it or the GBI processed the van. Uh, we were able to get uh, some hair fibers out of it. We got some other material out of it that didn't specify um, anybody with it. But we also got a list of people who had rented that van during the time period of the homicide. And because of the fake beard, we're assuming the fake beard at the time that was being worn, I said, well, let me also get a list of people who rented the van during Halloween. And I contacted the family who rented it during Halloween, and they said they didn't wear anything that had any fake hair, wigs, or anything like that inside the van. And on the list of people who rented the van during the homicide was um, Hemi Newman covering that specific date. 
So when you got the list of the individuals who had, list, who had rented the vehicle, um, would you characterize those names on that list now as, say, potential leads in your investigation? Correct. What about the physical description uh, that you were able to obtain from the witnesses? Did you do anything with the physical description? Else? We had a GBI forensic artist come out the, uh, the next day and speak with the witnesses to um, draw up a forensic um, sketch of the suspect. Once the forensic sketch is drawn up based on the description, what, if anything, do you do with that sketch? Um, uh, there were three sketches made up. I and you say three sketches, is that um, in relation to your three witnesses? For the three witnesses. Okay. Each witness did their own sketch with the, um, with the forensic artist. And based on all the information I had, I picked the sketch that most closely matched everybody's description at the time that they were interviewed. Okay. I what do with that? I um, presented the image to Andrea first to see if it reminded her of anybody. Do you know this person? What and she, uh, she said no, but she kept asking me to, can we take the beard off the picture? Can you remove the beard? Was, she asked me that several times, and I explained to her, we can't do that because that's not what the s witnesses saw. They saw the suspect with the beard, and we don't know what the facial structure is underneath the beard, so we can't guess at that. Okay. So at that time, did she maybe try and cover the beard or anything and, and take a look at the sketches? I don't recall? recall if she tried to do that or not. Do you recall if she made mention, you told us about the beard, do you recall if she made mention about any other physical characteristic that was shown in that sketch? No, she just, the p sketch did not remind her of anybody. Did she mention the eyes in the sketch? I don't remember. Did she mention the the nose and the sketch? No, she was just focusing on the beard. Okay. So, now, after you went out to the scene that morning and you spoke to the three witnesses, um, the, was that done before or after you got the list from the car rental company, the speaking to the witnesses? The car list from the car rental company happened in December. Okay. So at the time that you spoke to the witnesses, did you have any leads on who had killed Rusty Snyderman? No specific names. All we had was a description of a vehicle. At the time we spoke to the witnesses, a description of the vehicle and the sketch. Did you have any leads on why someone would shoot and kill Rusty Snyderman? No. At the time that you were at the scene and you interviewed those three witnesses, did you have any idea who you were looking for? No. Do you know whether or not Mr. Snydevin had any personal effects on him that were recovered at the scene? He had a, um, an envelope in his jacket pocket that looked like he may have been trying to, may have trying to go to the uh, post office afterwards to mail it. Uh, wedding band, watch. What about a wallet? Uh, there was no wallet on the scene. Did you look for a wallet at the scene? We did, and we asked um, the people from the um, clinic that was a few doors down that came out to help Rusty if they remember seeing a wallet, and nobody ever remembered seeing a wallet on the scene. During the course of your investigation, did you ever locate a wallet? No. Did you do anything else on the 18th after you left, or at the scene, after you spoke to the witnesses um, and called in the uh, technicians? Yes, after I was, after I felt I, I couldn't get any more information from the scene itself, I contacted uh, Detective Gobley, who was at the hospital where Rusty was transported to see what information she has been able to gather there. She told me. Don't tell us what anybody else said. I mean, she told me what she gathered, okay. and then I went down to the hospital. So you sent some uh, other officers down to the hospital? That's correct. Uh, okay. What else did you do um, 
after you spoke to the witnesses at the scene? Well, I went down to the hospital. Okay. I um, looked inside the. Which hospital did you go to? I believe it was the Atlanta Medical Center. The um, personal effects um, that the hospital staff put Rusty's stuff into the, the bag. I looked in that bag for the wallet, no wallet in the bag. I went to the little family room where the Snydermans um, were sitting waiting for information from the hospital staff. And I spoke with Andrea and the family very briefly in the waiting room. Okay. Now, at, do you know about what time this is? I have no idea what time it was. Okay. Was it soon after you left the scene? Was it uh, several hours? It was after left probably the scene? within an hour or two after uh, after I left the scene. Right. Or, uh, I went directly from the scene to the hospital, so it was within 30 minutes. All right. So within 30 minutes of leaving the scene, how long were you out at the scene? Say maybe an hour, ish. And I believe you testified to this, but I want to make sure. Do you know what time you arrived at the scene? I don't remember what time I arrived. All right. Um, so you went to the hospital. Yes. Did you do anything else that day? No, I spoke to this, the family at the hospital. and. Did you, when you spoke to the family at the hospital at that time, what did you tell them? I didn't tell them anything because the hospital staff had already informed them of what was going on, I now, believe. When you say, you guys identify I'm who sorry. you're talking to. When you say them and the family, you guys have to call names of who you're talking to. Yes, sir. At the hospital. At the hospital, I spoke to Andrea, her father and mother, and I don't re and uh, Todd, her brother, okay. was at the hospital. And I, and I need for you, when I ask you what did you say, I need for you to tell me what you said, okay, so that we're not talking about what others said. Yes, ma'am. Um, what did you say to the family when you arrived at the hospital? Well, I was ask, trying to get a baseline investigation going so I know what I need to be looking for. And I was, uh, we spoke very briefly about um, how Rusty was supposed to be having a, a, lu Go ahead. a lunch that day, so I got information about uh, Neil Jagoda. Let me just ask you this. In general, were you attempting to get information so that you would know where to start your investigation? Yes. All right. And when you attempted to get information through speaking with the family, did you develop what you would call some leads? I, I didn't know if there were leads at the time, but I developed information for me to start following up with once I was able to get back to the office. Okay. Did any of that information involve or include the name Hemi Newman? No. Um, so once you spoke to the family at the hospital, um, did you do anything else that day? Oh, uh, two search warrants were drawn up. One search warrant for Rusty Snyderman's vehicle and one search warrant for the house, for where Andrea and Rusty lived. All right. You drew up a, a search warrant for Rusty's vehicle. Why? We needed to search the vehicle to see if there was any evidence inside the vehicle that would be pertinent to this crime. And did you, in fact, search the vehicle? The GBI searched the vehicle. We had the car impounded to the GBI crime lab, got the search warrant, delivered it to them, and they did their, their search of the vehicle. Okay. And then the second search warrant you obtained was for the home? Correct. Whose home? Rusty and Andrea's house. All right. Um, and that was on the 18th of November? That's correct. Did you, in fact, go to execute the search warrant at the home? Yes. Sergeant Corlino and I went to the home that evening to serve the search warrant. Now, let me just back up a second and ask you, when you obtain a search warrant, um, explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the difference between a search warrant and a consent to search. A consent to search is the one of the more easier searches to obtain. You speak to the person, um, well, in this case, no, I speak to Andrea and say, may I search your house? And she says, yes. I 
have a form that says you have been advised of your rights that you can stop this search at any time and they have to be present to you during the consent to search and if at w any point they say I want you to stop searching this we stop searching for an actual search warrant you have to testify in front of a judge the facts of the case and why the location you want to search is pertinent to your investigation why do you think there might be evidence there? Why does it, how is it connected um, to, your, to your investigation? And if the judge um, believes that there's enough probable cause to connect the search location to your crime, then he grants a search warrant. And the search warrant supersedes anything that the family, whoever owns the property, can do. They, they cannot tell you to stop. They cannot bar you from going in. If they try to lock the door, you can kick the door in to do the search. You can do whatever you need to do to execute that search warrant. Okay. So a search warrant sort of takes the control away from the individual who's being searched. That's correct. Um, you don't have a choice in there. That person does not have the choice. Okay. And you did, in fact, obtain a search warrant from a judge I as it relates to your investigation? That's correct. I'm assuming this was an official investigation. Correct. And did you, in fact, go out to the defendant's home to execute the search warrant? I did. Were you successful? I was not. Tell us what happened. When we arrived at the house, um, Andrea, her father and mother, um, came out of the front door, and I told them that we were there to serve the search warrant, and Andrea's father refused to let us in. I ex was trying to explain to him that you really don't have a choice. We, we, ha we're going to, we have to come in and serve the search warrant. He continued to refuse to let us inside the house, and I was about to tell him, you either get out of the way or you're going to go to jail for obstruction. But at that point, uh, Sergeant Cordellino, my supervisor, said, don't That's tell us what he said, mm -hmm. but he, we, we, did he interject himself? Sergeant Corlino um, interjected, and we ended up not serving that search warrant that night. Okay. Now, w when you had this encounter um, with the defendant's father, you said that both she and her mother were, were present as well? Right, everybody was out in front. All right. And, uh, Andrea, the father and the mother, were out in front of the house. So you and Sergeant Corlino left? The Correct. residents at that time? Yes. Did you do anything else that day? No. All right, let, let's move to the next day, which would be November 19th. Is that correct? Yes. Did you go out to the defendant's home, or did you make arrangements to go out to the defendant's home? Well, we made arrangements to go out to the home to do an initial interview and to serve the search warrant. Ha with whom did you make the arrangements? I don't remember specifically, but they were aware that we're going to be coming over that day. So, I'm sorry, what did you say? No, I don't remember specifically who we made the arrangements with, but the family was aware that we were coming that day. Okay, so, so you made an appointment? That's correct. Um, do you remember what time you were going out to the home? I don't remember what time we actually got out there, but it was still daylight. Okay. Do you normally make appointments to serve a search warrant? No, sir, I do not. Go ahead. <coughs> and, and in fact, was it, was it your decision to, to make the appointment? or? Or was it your intent to execute the warrant? It was my the intent to execute warrant. the warrant the evening of the 18th. As my normal practice, um, whenever you're serving a search warrant on any location, whether regardless if it's the victims or suspects, I do not tell them that I am coming out to serve a search warrant to preserve the integrity of the case, basically. And why um, is that? Well, when you say preserve the integrity of the case, what does that mean? If you give a person notification you're coming out to serve a search warrant and they know that there's evidence inside or at the location you're going to search it gives them the opportunity to destroy or hide or move the evidence that is pertinent to the case and in this instance uh, you you were not able to execute that warrant on the night of the murder correct? that's correct and it was only by appointment that you were actually able to come out and execute the warrant on the next day. That's correct. About how many hours had passed, would you say, from the time that you went to the home on the 18th and the time that you were actually allowed into the home? It wasn't 24 hours, but it was definitely more than 12 hours. More than 12, more than 24. That's correct. 
So when you went out to the home, did you go along? Sergeant Cordellino came with me. So you and Sergeant Cordellino arrived at the home? Correct. Did you just walk in or did you knock on the door? Rang the doorbell, knocked on the door, being very polite. Um, they opened the door, uh, the family opened the door and let us into the house. So they invited you in? Correct. And when they invited you in, did you at that point just go in and start your search, uh, pursuant to your search warrant? No, we sat down at their um, dining room table, one of those large tables where you can sit a bunch of people around and um, had our initial interview with Andrew and the family. There was also, they were having, um, they had a bunch of family and friends in the house, kids in the house that were coming over for support of the family because of the incident that happened. So there were a lot of people in the home? A lot of people. And you all came in and were invited to sit down at the table? Correct. Kitchen table, living room table, dining room? It was a dining room table, um, very similar if you know you have a large family, is enough, it's large enough to sit a large family down and have a good dinner. And was there in fact, say, a large family seated at the table when you came in? Yes. Did they excuse themselves when you walked in or did they remain? No, we all sat down at the table and started discussing the incident. So your interview took place in which room? The dining room? I'm calling it the dining room. In the dining room. By invitation. By invitation. With about how many people seated at the table? By the end of the interview, um, one, two, seven, eight people. Seven or eight people. And I take note because you said by the end of the interview, were people just allowed access to and from the room during this? It was anybody could walk through the, the room that we were talking at any time. And I, I stopped short of saying what, how I was characterizing it. Was it a discussion or was it an interview? It was probably a combination of both. Um, I was, uh, you can't, it was more of a discussion based on the location, how many people were around, but I was interviewing the family to get some kind of information to guide me in the investigation. Okay. Um, when you say at some point, you're gonna have to identify who's sitting at this table. Yes, sir. There was, are we talking about do that now? Well. Uh, you're going to get to that? I was going to just, but well, we, can, we, can, we, can move, we can we can we can move to that point. And right. if you would just tell us who was seated at the table with you and Sergeant Cordellino. There was uh, Todd, Andrea's sister. Who's Todd? Uh, Andrea's brother, Todd. Okay. Um, Andrea. When you say Andrea, who you Andrea you Snyderman, the defendant. The defendant. Okay. Andrea's mother. Andrea's father. Do you know her mother's name? I don't recall it. All right. Do you recall her father's name? I believe it's Herb. Herb. Do you know the last name? Snyderman. Uh, it's not Snyderman. Uh, I don't remember the last name. Okay. So you the got a brother, her mother, her father, and her. Right. Who Rusty's else? mother and father. Do you recall? The victims. Do you recall their names? I do not. not. All right. Mr. and Mrs. Snyderman? Mr. and Mr. Snyderman. Who else? And eventually, Rusty's brother walked in. Do you remember his name?
at Rusty and Neil Jagoda were trying to start up as their own business. Jagoda? Jagoda. Is another name, was that one of the names on the list? That was one of the names <coughs> on the list, and she also mentioned that name during the discussion at the hospital. Okay. Uh, we spoke about investors in, um, in the Star Voicemail. Uh, we spoke about uh, their ex his, her exterminator, how he, the exterminator knows the schedule of the family. He's there quite, o quite often. They're good friends. Um, in fact, he called while we're doing this discussion at the house, and I spoke to him briefly on the phone, um, got his information, and followed up the phone call once I left the house. Okay. We spoke about... Um, a uh, suspicious male that was beside the house um, that was uh, Rusty found laying down next to their gas line into the house. Uh, when did that incident occur? I don't, remember, I don't remember the date, but it was uh, previous, um, prior to okay. the murder by days. And um, she actually was emphasized that she thought that the person laying next to the gas line was an extremely important person that we need to look into. Did she give you a name? She didn't give us a name. Um, she described what happened that day that she had already left for work. Rusty came okay. out. And again, without telling us specifically yes. everything that somebody else said, um, just try to listen to my question. Yes, ma'am. Um, did she give you the name of a person who was lying beside the house? No name was given. Now, you told us that she gave you information that included Hemi Newman, Mr. and Mrs. Clark, Mr. Jagoda, the investors in Star Voicemail, an exterminator, mm -hmm. and an individual that was lying beside the house. That's correct. At an, on a date prior to the shooting. Correct. Do you recall anyone else that may have been included on this list of people? I don't recall anything. Okay. Now, was this actually a physical list that was given or a list of names that came out throughout the course of the discussion slash During the course of the discussion. All right. So, when you said the exterminator actually called, correct? Correct. When the exterminator called, has she given you that name already? Uh, she did. And tell me how much information you were able to get from the defendant about the exterminator. Well, just that. He, uh, how much information were you able to get? Enough to know that that's somebody I just I should probably talk to. Okay. So so the exterminator kind of went down on your list. Correct. Now, what about Mr. Jagoda? How much information were you able to get about Mr. Jagoda? I, was, I actually spoke to Mr. Jagoda the day of the 18th. He came in to do an interview. Did you call him in? I called him in. And right. he was so you actually called Mr. Jagoda in the day before? Correct. Based on the information you had gotten at the hospital? Correct. And from the defendant, how much information were you able to get about Mr. Jagoda? Uh, enough to establish that what she was telling me was the same thing that he's, he told me in the interview before, so I know that it was legitimate information. Okay, so, so would you agree or disagree that, that the mention of Mr. Jagoda and information about him um, took, took how much time? It was a, a decent, decent amount of time. It was, I don't know exactly how much, it was more, you know, it was, I want to say 15, 20 minutes talking about star voicemail, maybe a little bit longer, and Neil Jagoda was the primary partner with Rusty in this business venture. And what about the, the conversation about the exterminator? How much time did that take? It didn't take a lot of time, but it was a, she had enough, enough detail about what the exterminator knew to make me think, well, that's somebody I have to include in my investigation. You know, she, she provided, you know, I, I've already stated, that he knew the schedule because he's there during the mornings to 
um, do the extermination. He knows when he can and can't be there because that's he knows when people are going to be at the house or not at the house, and he's been doing it long enough that um, they knew each other very well. And this is all information you got from the defense? That's correct. Uh, what about Mr. and Mrs. Clark? How much time did you all spend talking about Mr. and Mrs. Clark? Spent a good part of the um, discussion about Discovery Point, how Rusty worked there, and it, they were a horrible um, couple to work for. They initially hired Rusty to possibly take over the franchise business for them because they didn't have any kids to take over, so we're looking for somebody to pass the torch off to, basically, because they wanted to retire from the business. And things weren't working out. They put a, um, a hidden camera that's hidden in a smoke detector in his office to spy on him and how co-workers would come to him to voice their disgust with the Clarks and was going the, there Rusty was basically the relief valve for a lot of the employees at the main office. So and this again is all information that you're getting from the defendant about Mr. and Mrs. Clark. That's correct. Um, would you characterize it as being a significant amount of information or Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes, there was a significant amount of information. And what about Mr. Newman? How much information were you able to get about him? Not that much. Uh, approximately an hour and 16 minutes into the interview, um, I specifically asked Andrea, the defendant, um, if anybody had attempted to break up their marriage or shown interest in her, and she said yes. Um, her boss, Hemi Newman. And so I'm going to stop you for a second, because you just told us an hour and 16 minutes into the interview slash discussion. You asked her a specific question. Yes, ma'am. And it was at that time that you got the name Hemi Newman. Correct. So is it safe to say that this inf information was not volunteered? That's correct. What about uh, the uh, information about the other individuals? Mm -hmm. Did you have to ask specific questions to get that information, or did they give you that information freely? It was given voluntarily. And you told us about um, the individual that she mentioned uh, that was lying next to the house? Correct. Days before, or I don't know, at some period before the shooting. Is that correct. correct? Yes. Do you remember if it was days, weeks, months, years? I don't recall. I'd have to look at the, the if, um, documentation for the date. And while you may not recall the exact date, do you recall if it was close in time to the shooting or years before? Within weeks. Okay. Um, and what information would you get about this individual? Andrea told me that Rusty smelt um, a possible gas leak or smelt gas in the air. He went over to the side of the house where the gas line came into the house to see what was going on. He found a person laying down by the gas line. He confronted the person, um, asked him a couple of questions. The person stood up, looked at Rusty, and then ran away. And at that point, Rusty got into his car, pulled up in front of the house, and called the police. Was a description of that individual given? Um, she called him a, uh, a Mexican man or a Mexican, um, stated that uh, when he ran, he couldn't have gone down one particular side of the house. There was a large gully down there, and if you went down there, you could seriously hurt yourself. So he had to have run in the uh, other direction, um, down to the end of the cul-de-sac. There's a path that goes into another, um, another neighborhood over there, and as he was running away... Is this Mrs. Snyderman saying what somebody else said? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sustain, gonna, yes, sir, I'm gonna sustain that objection. I'm going to direct that if you would. Yes, Judge, I will. Uh, I'm just responding if there's an objection. That's sustainable. Yes, I will. I will. All right. And remember, listen to my questions and answer yes, my questions only, okay? 
You had a description. I think you said she called him the Mexican man. Is that correct? That's correct. Your Honor, with permission, I would ask the court to play a clip of what has been identified as. I'm sorry. Can I just get the number? You may. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before that clip is played, we're going to go ahead and give you a, your break at this point in time. So cue it up. Well, not cue it up. Just put it in that location on where you're going to be. But ladies and gentlemen, when I give you this break, you're going to be breaking for lunch at this point in time. Do not discuss the case. I allow anyone to discuss the case with you. You can leave your notepads there in the jury room to turn them face down. No one's going to look at your notes. And if you need additional notepads, let Deputy Garrett know, and he'll get you additional notepads and additional pencils. But do not remain upon the floor when I release you. Do not interact with anyone you should not interact with, as I made to you earlier in the week, and I will tell you every week, every day during this week. Do not sit next to anyone who may be discussing the case or allow anyone to sit next to you during the lunchtime. Even if you collectively go to lunch together or individually, do not discuss the case when you're at lunch. Do not read or look at any media coverage pertaining, case, uh, pertaining to this case. Do not go upon the internet and do any research about this case. Do not blog about this case while it's ongoing. Do not go to any location that may or may not have been made reference to. All the evidence will come to you in the form of sworn testimony or any physical evidence that's introduced during the course of the trial. You want to work and bring something to snack. You want to eat with you during the afternoon break. Do not consume any alcoholic beverages during lunch. Deputy Garrett will turn back over to your cell phones and communication devices, but when you come back from lunch, just put them in the off position so that they will not be vibrating during the um, afternoon session. The lawyers and parties cannot talk or interact with you, uh, so I don't want, ever want you to think they're being rude or discourteous. Uh, Deputy Garrett, we're going to be on recess until 1.30. All rise. <clears throat> into the world that is I generally like a latte. That's about it. I use uh, lattes. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I only eat one meal a day. Jeffrey, okay, get away from me. Don't talk to me about that. I believe in eating all day long. Uh, you know what? You're lucky. You've been you've been blessed to have. Uh, no, no, no. I eat three know? cups of fruit every morning. Wife, I follow a mostly vegetarian diet. My wife is under pounds. She eats like a hog. Oh, I don't. I can't. I gain weight like that. Yeah, I can't do it. But I eat tons of fruits and vegetables. I don't eat white sugar, white flour. But I do, I have sort of an allergy allergy to dairy, so I drink lattes. It stuns my appetite. It deadens, it numbs my appetite. All right, enjoy so your big old I fat have. latte. It's a system I have. It's very emotional morning. Highly effective. Hey, you got ice? Yeah, I do. I need to touch She's gone for a good while, while an undercover detective testified about the morning of Rusty's murder. The detective described Andrea arriving at the scene that he was shouting at. Oh. Oh, my check. Oh, yeah, should I hold it? Test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I have IP so loud. I'm, I can't hear. Sorry. that we were all texting. Yeah. Well, I just lost IP. Yeah. I have it. You don't have it now, Jay? What? IP. I have it, yep. We have it. They also said oh, surveillance video oh, of right. her with the officer holding on to the collapse. But the detective says he never told her. Told Andrea that her husband had been shot and he says he doesn't recall Andrea asked her to see what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 